You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Hi, neighbors. First, I want to remind you that Paracast is brought to you this week by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 85,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Paracast. So, of course, on last week's episode of the Paracast with Gene and Chris, we had... I guess the honor, really, enjoyed talking with him of Ed Comerick, an exopolitics aficionado. Now, one of the things here that was interesting is that I kind of lit into him for the first part of the show. And most people seemed to take that in stride. Other people said, shut up already, let the guy speak. Of course, here in the Powercast, we do feel sometimes that people have to be called out. And one of the reasons we called out Ed was because of the fact that he was telling us about what he found on the Internet. You can find lots of wacky things on the Internet, but because you find wacky things on the Internet doesn't necessarily mean you believe those wacky things on the Internet. You have to show a little bit of skepticism. And I was hitting him on that, and then, of course, things settled down. And I guess the other point he was raising is maybe the powers that be are keeping us from getting the evidence, what, the military-industrial complex, the government, the oil industry, et cetera, et cetera. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. What's your take, Chris? Well, you know, I, I agree. I think that it's really important to vet your sources when you're, when you're on the net. And I, I found quite a bit of very good information for my uh, trickster book from uh, .edu sites, uh, papers published by aspiring anthropologists, that, that sort of thing. There is a lot of good information on the Internet. I'll be the first one to admit that. But you really do have to pick and choose very carefully. And a rule of thumb that I you know, try to adhere to is at least try to find other sources that can give you the same fact. You know, do uh, get corroboration of a particular fact. That's kind not, of the standard. But not source back to the original source. Uh, of course, of <laughs> so, course, you don't have to. But certainly in traditional journalism, which isn't practice enough in this day and age, exactly. they say get another source to back you up. Well, of get course, two, ideally. Ideally, get two sources. You know, the original, another one, maybe another one. Basically, check and double-check everything, and then you report it. The problem is now with 24-7 cable news, they don't do that anymore. They get the story out there figuring they will correct it as they go along, but then, of course, people get the wrong impression. It's a slippery slope. You just have to really be doubly careful, dot your I's, cross your T's, and, you know, only stick your, uh, your, your neck out, so to speak, if you feel that you have enough corroborating information to back up a particular fact, uh, the more controversial, the more important that is, obviously, to do. The other thing, of course, in terms of talking with Ed Comerick is that he was mentioning the fact that he felt some of these other exopolitics adherents were not turning up their spam filters enough particularly talking about those who claim that President Obama has gone to Mars or something, and he specifically was talking about Alfred Weber. Right. Our Yale Law School graduate that seems to have absolutely no powers of discernment or uh, his level of credulity is like non-existent. <laughs> well, that's very interesting right there, the fact that you mentioned that. We have somebody who has incredible, apparently genuine this time, I hope, educational credentials, and it doesn't help. No, no, I mean, go figure, which suggests to me that there may be an underlying agenda that has to do with dissemination of disinformation. But we won't get into that, will we, Gene? Disin for what? <laughs> disinformation. Well, I guess the thing that bothers me about that is if there's so much disinformation out there, how do you find a kernel of fact? Or do you find the right kernel to give you those facts to be very foolish about it? Or the right kernel to give you a chicken wing. That one, of course, yes. Around this time of season, we have to think about the colonel and the chicken wings. Of course, they'll find a conspiracy theory about that. You know, somebody in the forums was making a big deal over what it would sound like. Listen for this now. What it would sound like if they played my conversation backwards. You know, would I say Paul is dead backwards or something like that? <laughs> well, we need to get, what's his name, that, uh, that David Oates guy, uh... What the heck's his name? The reverse speech guy? Boy, he'd have a field day with us, wouldn't he, Gene? This one person, his name is Luke, by the way. Use the force, Luke. Anyway, Luke. <laughs> anyway, Luke 
said that he was going to make a recording of me talking backwards. So he picked out the interview we did a few years ago on the PowerCast with Paula Harris, who's another one of those exopolitics people. And I met her once, by the way. I thought she was a really nice woman. But we don't agree with her. There you go. I think she's too accepting of some things. Regardless, he took one of my monologues during that interview. He took this segment where I was basically kind of summarizing the interview, saying that the, her process is like running a forum where you take all sorts of opinions, you don't necessarily judge those opinions. So someone took some of my key phrases and played them in reverse. I did not say, well, Paul is dead. I did not provide the solution to the UFO mystery. What did you say? You said Paula is an abductee. Paula is an abductee. That's right. Instead of saying <laughs> one hen, two ducks, three squawking geese. Hey, that was it. That's what I was saying backwards. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, four limerick oysters. Remember the famous Jerry Lewis announcer's test where it's uh, basically... No, that's, that's a little bit before my time, Gene. It's basically picking up your retentive memory or your attention span or something like that. And the way it works is... Doves and a partridge in a pear tree? You have to repeat what he says. And so he adds one condition, one hen, one hen, two ducks, one hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, up to ten of these. And you have to repeat each one back to him, precisely as they said it. I got up to seven after practicing for a long, long time. Of course, Jerry Lewis is, what, 119 years old now and probably not capable of remembering anything. But I shouldn't be saying that because I'll be 120 very soon. Okay, today we're going to bring back a guest who has really been a fascinating, fascinated collector of information about strange creatures, Lauren Coleman. And I've known him for a long, long time. I know at one time he wrote a book with Jerome Clark, and this was the time I knew both of them, so that goes back quite a few years. What are your encounters and experiences with Lauren Coleman? Well, of course, like many of our, our forum uh, posters and the uh, listeners of the Paracast, I'm I'm a real fan of uh, the Cryptomundo.com uh, site that uh, Lauren runs with uh, Craig Wolheater and writing a column uh, every month for uh, the World Explorer magazine uh, called Crypto Corner. I have a, a column that I kind of cull through the uh, month's activities in the crypto world, world of crypto research and investigation. Uh, quite frankly, <laughs> most of the good quality stories come from Cryptomundo, and Lauren, I think, is one of our top most visible experts in this field, and it's a real pleasure and an honor to have him on the show. And by the way, he has a museum. He does, yeah. up in Maine. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you ever want to go to Maine, he's going to tell you about the museum. Mm -hmm. And I know we provide a link in the forums, so you know if you want to see what his museum is like, you can go in there, and you can take a look and see just you know what, what kind of stuff he's going to. It's the International Cryptozoology Museum. Let me give you the address before we get Lauren on. It's at 11 Avon Street in Portland, Maine and appears to be open Wednesday through Saturday, and then for a brief period of time on Sunday. I guess this is his day job. Mm -hmm. And you get to see all sorts of fascinating exhibits, and we're going to cover that. And, of course, we're not going to have any contest here where you get a paid vacation to Maine, especially in the winter, you know, where you can bring your snowblowers out. But it sounds like a really interesting thing to do, and maybe we should have a UFO museum next. Well, we do, down in Roswell. Of course. Well, I'm thinking not just Roswell, but, you know, a place that is not so tainted. So, neighbors, if you have a comment or a question about the PowerCast, you know where to send it, news at thepowercast.com. Once again, that's news at thepowercast.com. We promise to read each and every message, Chris and I, and we'll try to answer most of them. And, by the way, if you do want to join our team, you have a background in sales, especially online sales, and broadcast experience as a salesperson is a must. Do write us, news at thepowercast.com. Once again, that's news at thepowercast.com. We have Lauren Coleman coming up next on The Paracast. <laughs> 
As you know, the Paracast is brought to you by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 85,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, featuring audio versions of many New York Times bestsellers. For our listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service, such as Leslie Kane's UFOs, generals, pilots, and government officials go on the record. For that free audiobook, go to audiblepodcast.com slash paracast. That's audiblepodcast.com slash paracast. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Hi, Jason Lewis here. Anybody who's been listening to my program knows how shaky the U.S. economy is right now. Will we have a V-shaped recovery or will it be a W-shaped one where the nation slips back into recession? Of course, if you think that Washington can spend or inflate its way out of a downturn, you've got nothing to worry about. But as you know, I have my doubts. So let me tell you about gold. Now, as my friend Ted Anderson from Midas Resources likes to say, gold, like all commodity markets, fluctuates in price, and you could lose money. But it has never been worth zero. Give it some thought, and if you're interested in converting your IRA to gold or would like to actually have it in your possession, call Midas Resources today at 1-800-686-2237. The U.S. dollar was once backed by gold, but has since lost 90% of its value. And if things don't change, I'm afraid the trend will continue. Call Midas Resources today at 1-800-686-2237 for gold and tell them Jason Lewis sent you. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Don't forget, CrossbreedHolsters.com. That's the sound of your door being kicked in by an intruder with a single kick. That's the sound of the same door now protected by the Door Sentinel at MySafeDoor.com. Go to MySafeDoor.com right now and watch the amazing video. At MySafeDoor.com, you'll learn how to turn your home into a fortress with the Door Sentinel. 16 kicks later, and the Door Sentinel is still holding strong. MySafeDoor.com. That's MySafeDoor.com. Did you know that gold and silver contain healing properties? It's true. Since the beginning of mankind's history, gold and silver have not only been used as real money, but also for healing our minds and bodies. Utopiasilver.com is your leading source for colloidal silver and colloidal gold, offering supplement protocols that can heal and enhance your health. Protocols for boosting the immune system, insomnia, yeast infections, herpes, and countering the effects of vaccinations and radiation poisoning. And now Utopia. Utopiasilver.com encourages the use of real money with this buy one, get one free real money special. For details and your colloidal silver and colloidal gold supplements, call 888-213-4338 and ask about 50% off for first-time customers. That's 888-213-4338 or visit utopiasilver.com, utopiasilver.com, fighting for liberty and healing one American at a time. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. We are now taking a virtual trip to the International Cryptozoology Museum, where sits the one, the only, Lauren Coleman. Hi, Lauren. Good evening. How are you, Gene? We're doing fine. Chris and I are just doing great. We kind of wish we could be over there. We could have some kind of roundtable discussion. But we don't have a rich person anymore to pay for our transportation. Right. 
Yes, all of the wealthy cryptozoology sponsors died in the 60s. So yeah. We're all beholden to we're, um, it. Like when you really best. need one, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, too. Where is today's variation of, say, a Lawrence Rockefeller? I'm not talking about Robert Bigelow because he puts too many terms and conditions on his grants. I mean somebody, no terms, no conditions, somebody who is willing to offer the money with a reasonable proposal and go from there. Well, you do have the MacArthur grants, the genius grants, and what's unfortunate is that there's no cryptozoologist that's won it yet, but, you know, someday something fantastic like that might happen, and then nothing but imagination could steer that person to create some great projects or go on expeditions or whatever. But there aren't too many uh, wealthy individuals out there giving to cryptozoology right now, that's for sure. But what would it require to earn their money? Would you still have to provide some DNA from Bigfoot or something like that? I'm not sure. I mean, I think that if we're going to get into current events, there's the whole Ericsson project that's going on right now. That's a very wealthy man that's behind that. I mean, he put out the call. He tried to get various people, some of them, mainstream Bigfoot hunters, others kind of on the edge, because if you put out a call that, uh, do you have a piece of Bigfoot? I'd like to test it. You're going to get all kinds of different uh, fringe people and people trying to, right now on one of the websites uh, recently, there was the quote unquote stake of a Bigfoot being offered for sale for $50,000. So somebody says something like that, there's going to be somebody come up with a, a piece of meat and say that it's from Bigfoot. So it's kind of, you know, touch and go about where we're at with this whole process of the money and funding and what constitutes, obviously what constitutes the ultimate proof is DNA and samples that really are verifiable and have a chain of command where you can really detail where it came from. I guess the big question here is, after all these years, why have we not gotten something that mainstream science can regard as a smoking gun? Why is it so elusive? Well, there's um, several levels of answers to that. Let me let me start with uh, the name Bigfoot. Bigfoot doesn't help. Bigfoot is a silly name, and it's been often said that there's enough evidence uh, with all of the hair samples, the fecal material, the films, the eyewitness accounts, that if this was a murder case, you could get many convictions for murder with the evidence we have for Bigfoot. But we have the disability that has a name, it has a mythology almost now that really gets in the way. And anthropologists, which we're really up against, have the whole ghost of the fifth down skull. And anytime there's a fakery in the cabinet that's as recent as the 1950s, you're going to have a higher standard put out there for proof. So right now, the only way that Bigfoot will be proven is with a live capture or a dead body. So you have the situation where we really need a body. We need a body. We need a live capture of a Bigfoot, a Yeti, some kind of unknown hominid to really prove to anthropologists, to the skeptical debunking community that these creatures actually exist and that we have a whole new species. Because right now you've got many situations where, like with the ivory-billed woodpecker, you know, if you go to Cornell, you definitely know, think and know that uh, the ivory-billed woodpecker has been rediscovered. But if you go to other universities, it's still somewhat doubtful. Well, we never want to get in that situation with Bigfoot. We want to make sure that the proof is ironclad, that a scientific academic folks are going to sign on with this, that it's actually going to be verified as a new species and not some, you know, kind of mutant or uh, feral human or some other thing. So there's lots of uh, possibilities. Now, the other part that I'm always asked is, why don't we ever find a body? Um, well, th that, that's a whole other ball of wax, and I don't know if you want to go down that road. Well, you know what? Why don't we go down that road? You raised it. This is the Paracast where we go where no show ever goes. Okay. So right. tell us, okay, why not? Well, uh, once again, it's, it's not a simple answer. It's a very complex situation. For one thing, I don't really consider it reality to even consider that uh, Bigfoot are being drawn up into UFOs, that they're burying their dead, that they're teleporting into another dimension when they die. Let's uh, take it from my uh, frame of reference, which is a very zoological, biological point of view. 
if you have an animal out there that actually uh, is in the woods of North America, and let's say very specifically the Pacific Northwest, and, and Dr. Grover Krantz estimated that there was any where between 2,000 and 4,000 alive at any one time. If you take a population that small, and he often would say there's probably one Bigfoot for every 10,000 black bear. Well, Grover Krantz and I used to do something whenever we would travel all over the country, and I've been to every state in the continental U.S., and I've asked um, wildlife individuals, biologists, hunters, hikers, how many times have you been in the forest and you have found a dead black bear, a dead grizzly, or a mountain lion in the woods, not hit on the road, not, you know, shot and killed by someone and lying on the ground, but a naturally occurring dead body of one of those large animals. My The answer that I always get is zero. Even though we know there are mountain lions, even though we know there's grizzlies and that there's black bear, People do not find these animals dead in the woods, and yet we know that they're out there and they have to die. So what happens? What happens with these known animals that are dying in the woods? Well, several things. They they curl up and they go to a den. They go. Um, mountain lions have been known to when they figure figure out that they're close to death, they go in leaves and and you know try to bury themselves in the leaves, and then. You have a situation where within 24 to 48 hours, crows, blue jays, um, coyotes, right, all kinds time. of vultures, they, they start ripping apart the body. And then very quickly, you know, it's decimated. There's nothing there that's left. And with the larger bones, there's an animal in North America that everybody forgets about. But I, I use the example in the state of Maine where I'm at. The state of Maine is the most forested state in the United States. The surface of the state is covered in 95% trees. We have 40,000 moose every year dropping their antlers all over the state. That's not even including the deer. And yet all of those tourists from the Atlantic coast that come up to Maine because we're vacation land and they go hiking, they don't trip over antlers all spring and summer. Well, where did all the antlers go? They're eaten. They're eaten by rodents. And one of the biggest, you know, consumers of antlers are porcupines. And we'll have to answer that question more in a moment. With Lauren Coleman, with Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are... The GCN Radio Network. This time of year, between the holidays, bad weather, and sick days, getting everyone in the same room for a meeting can be impossible. And that's why I recommend Go to Meeting by Citrix. I love the special Go to Meeting app. I want you to try it free today. Go to the App Store or Android Market to download the free app and start joining Go to Meeting sessions from anywhere and host your own meetings with a free 30 day trial. Visit gotomeeting.com, click Try It Free, and use the promo code PODCAST for Go to Meeting. You expect professional service from your doctor, your accountant, and even the girl who takes your morning coffee order. Why not from your domain registrar, too? Namecheap.com provides stellar service with no sneaky upselling. We offer more features and security options for your website than there are ways to order a latte. And new domains come with WhoisGuard to protect your personal info. At Namecheap.com, you can get your domain for as low as $2.99. Now is a great time to get to know Namecheap.com. Local Army Navy surplus stores are hard to find these days, but not military issue supplies. They're right here online at MainMilitary.com. That's right, just like the state, M-A-I-N-E, military.com. We have everything for true, total preparedness. MainMilitary.com is not a typical website. It has much more than your old surplus store. Quality military-issue survival gear like canteens, mess kits, utensils, gas masks, filters, and chemical suits, magnesium fire-starting tools, strike anywhere, waterproof, and storm matches, first aid kits, splints, tourniquets, parachute 550 cord, military manuals, sandbags by the bale, and a huge molly assortment of vests and pouches for every need. 
Call 207-989-6783. 207-989-6783. Or visit MainMilitary.com. That's M-A-I-N-E Military.com. The main name in military supply. Burglars love easy targets, like a dark house that looks like no one is home. Don't let your home be the next target. Make it look like someone is home watching television with fake TV. Fake TV is a small electronic device that makes the same light as a real television, so from outside it looks like someone is home watching TV. Fake TV plugs in just like a lamp on a timer, but is far more convincing to burglars. Fake TV deters burglars, costs far less than an alarm, comes with AC adapter, and is highly recommended by numerous police departments. Use it anytime you're away from home. To order your fake TV for only $34.95, go to faketv.com or call 1-877-5-FAKE-TV. Each additional fake TV is only $29.95. So get one for you and give one or more for Christmas. Now through Christmas, get free standard shipping on any quantity fake TV purchase. Call 877-5-F-A-K-E-TV or go to faketv.com. Faketv.com, the burglar deterrent. Discover a natural way to experience cleaner, healthier indoor air without expensive filters and high-priced machines. Discover what healthcare professionals have known for decades. Salt ionizes and purifies indoor air. That's why you need to visit SilverSkyImports.com. SilverSkyImports.com offers a wide assortment of Himalayan crystal salt lamps, handcrafted from salt crystals that are millions of years old, contain healthy ions that eliminate odor, reduce bacteria, and can even help allergy and asthma sufferers, which means you and your family will breathe better, sleep sounder, and have more energy. These salt lamps are available in stunning, natural colors and shapes to accent any home or office, are environmentally friendly, and best of all, they're affordable. And don't forget, Silver Sky Imports com also carries gourmet and bath salts. Order today at SilverSkyImports.com or call 800-494-1369. That's 800-494-1369. Breathe easier, feel better, live healthier at SilverSkyImports.com. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned into the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? With Gene and Chris, we're talking to Lauren Coleman at his headquarters at the International Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, Maine. And you're saying porcupines are have, notorious. I have, I have a really good porcupine story. I, sure. I was hiking up above tree line. I was at about 11,000 feet in the Sangre de Cristos, and I left my belt <laughs> outside my tent uh, to, to wake up in the morning and find that a porcupine had eaten my belt and left the buckle. And I could tell it was a porcupine because he was sitting there looking at me. Uh, that's a really good point, Lauren. I didn't know that they also consume bone. Oh, yeah, they, they need the bone because of their quills and their, their, and their bones. And they actually they have a behavior that archaeologists have really uh, found very endearing. They take these bones, the larger leg bones and the antlers and things, and they hoard them in their dens so that they don't, I mean, you were lucky to actually see this porcupine there eating your belt, but oftentimes they pull them back in their dens and then they take a few days to eat away at it. So archaeologists have actually began finding fossil and prehistoric porcupine dens to find fossils of uh, human remains in these. It really is kind of widening the, the our knowledge of prehistoric humans. Hmm. Wow. So, uh, so that's yeah. Nature, that's nature has thinking. a way of, of turning all this stuff back over and uh, you know <laughs> oh, back sure. into dust. Belts into bones, right? Right. So it's so, part um, of nature's rhythm, the circle of life. Yes, it is, and I I just don't think we're going to find Bigfoot uh, in any kind of conventional way. We're not going to trip across it in the woods. My whole theory is that I think that someday. There's going to be a lumber truck someplace that's going to hit a Bigfoot, and it's going to be in a situation where they'll be able to get the remains right away and uh, get them to a university. Uh, but the whole thing about Bigfoot, they're primate, and, uh, you know, they just don't they, – they actually try to avoid human vehicles, human people, you know, people that are in the woods, and they're just not trying to be seen. It's just that – it's really kind of a coincidence that there's a human and a Bigfoot in the same spot occasionally, and those are called sightings. 
Now, therefore, we assume Bigfoot doesn't want to see who we are or what we are. They want to stay away from us. Well, I don't think they're as curious about us as we are about them. I mean, there's a lot of people that project their own feelings on Bigfoot and say, you know, well, they're interested in us and they want to see where we're living and they want to come around to the farm and and see what kind of animals we're raising and uh, all kinds of stuff that we're really projecting on these. And, and, uh, you know, most of us like Krantz and Sanderson and other people down through the years that I've talked to, we really understand that uh, most of these cryptids we're really trying to pro- project a whole life on them with only about 1% of any kind of knowledge about what they're doing. We see Bigfoot crossing the road. That doesn't mean they live there. We see Bigfoot, you know, fishing for salmon in, in creeks or eating blueberries or things like that. Or, you know, occasionally people make up stories that they uh, they hear a, a certain noise in the woods, whether it's a something like a stick beating against a tree or or a screech or different things like that, and they immediately go to the place, well, that's a squash, that's a, a sasquatch, that's a Bigfoot. And then they construct a whole science fiction story around that one incident that may have nothing to do with the reality of these creatures. I think it's, you know, it's kind of one of, that's been one part of it. The other part that I talk about in my book, Bigfoot, the True Story in North America, in America is that actually uh, because we're in such a prudish society, most Bigfoot researchers for the last 50 years have been le- leaving out details about the sexuality of these creatures. Do they have a penis? Do they, you know, was the sighting, did it talk about gender specific uh, details that the researchers are leaving out because they're too embarrassed? And that's the whole projecting the human you know, shyness and prudishness on on these creatures based upon who we are. And that's really got in the way of some of the research. You know, so anthropomorphizing our, our own cultural exactly. beliefs uh, and, and overlaying them on, on, on these creatures when we really don't have the, uh, the data to really support that is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. And, it, I mean, it, it's very obvious when you go out and you study bonomos or gorillas or chimpanzees, People understand those are animals, and you report on their sexual activity, on their breeding, upon all of these things. And yet you read what I did a few years ago when I wrote this book is I I read and read and read through all of these accounts of researchers. And they would – it's obvious that uh, the eyewitness had seen it long enough, and yet they'd say – put one line in there about uh, he says they were breasts. And then it goes on. The researcher goes on, well, were they round? Did they have hair on them? Did they have nipples? You know, there's all kinds of questions that were avoided. It was almost like reading the Warren Commission transcript. Well, why didn't you ask those questions? You know, you're trying to learn about this animal. This animal may be new to us. Ask more questions about the biological specimen. And it's just kind of frustrating sometimes because, once again, we're dealing with just humans, and humans do uh, do these projections, these anthropomorphic projections. All right, but even if we go past trying to make Bigfoot assume a personality similar to a human being, maybe they're just a bunch of Neanderthals running about. Okay, what about those who theorize that Bigfoot and other creatures are really from other dimensions, somehow related to UFO and other paranormal events? Well, I think that that's a whole other show for somebody else. Uh, one of the things that I do at the museum, when somebody comes in and they start talking about other dimensions or UFOs or ghosts, that's all well and good. And I'm a, I'm an old, old Fordian. You know, I have all kinds of room in my brain for the lots of different possibilities and Fordian phenomena if you show me the data. But I have not been shown anything that makes my anthropological, zoological background feel like I need to talk about Bigfoot as aliens or Bigfoot from another dimension. Everything I'm seeing about them tells me this is a primate that's unknown. It may be related to Paranthropus. It may be related to Gigantopithecus. That's what I know. That's what I'll talk about. And so I was a very, a very thoughtful follower of Ivan T. Sanderson. And he once told me, he said, You know, there's no reason to explain one unknown with another unknown. He said, I'm interested in the tangible intangibles, the things that 
we certainly can measure, we can see fecal material from, but I'm not interested in talking about a Bigfoot being a ghost. And that's very much, I followed in that line. I, I'm just, it's a waste of my time because I'm just kind of blowing air, uh, blowing smoke into the air and it just disappears because it doesn't have any sense of continuity with the kind of studies that I'm doing to go off into a tangent talking about ghosts. All right, so we assume these strange creatures are just here and we just need to figure a way to understand them better. No, I'm, I'm telling you my bias. Okay, no, I understand I your bias, but I wanted yeah, to right. clarify it for our listeners. So this is basic, right, right. the basic assumption here is that, yeah, there are unusual creatures out there, but no reason to think that they're alien to us, that they're just here and we just need right, to... Right, I think they're... Yeah. I think that most of the cryptozoological specimens that I study are one of two kinds. They're either brand new animals that have been seen by native peoples or experienced by indigenous peoples as a natural history that comes into their consciousness and they experience as, as you know, real animals. And that it's our quest as cryptozoologists to try to find those new species, whether it turns out to be a coelacanth or a copy giant panda, mountain gorilla. And then I think there are these other uh, animals that are being seen that are extinct animals that actually, um, that Western science has said, well, they don't exist anymore. And cryptozoologists are saying, well, maybe they do. Maybe the, the thylacine is still out there. And we maybe have to these- point out we have something else that's still out there waiting to be discovered. We're talking to Lauren Coleman with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. That bears repeating. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. And Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse is the key to digestive health. Pro-EM-1 is a powerful liquid probiotic, strong enough to cleanse, gentle enough to use every day. Pro-EM-1 is dairy, wheat, and soy-free, contains all natural and certified organic ingredients, contains no preservatives or animal products, supports a healthy digestive and immune system, supports weight loss, improves absorption of food nutrients, aids in controlling yeast infections, is never freeze-dried, and uses three groups of live, viable, beneficial microbes to cleanse and remove toxins. Order Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse at Terraganics.com, spelled T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com, Terraganics.com. Or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Pro-EM-1, the raw probiotic. What looks good under your Christmas tree and tastes even better? Big Berkey water filters. Yes, the gift of clean water. A gift that provides a great foundation for achieving good health in the lives of your loved ones. A Big Berkey water filter gives them protection from bacteria, heavy metals, chlorine, fluoride, pesticides and herbicides, VOCs and more. And best of all, a Big Berkey water filter is a gift that lasts for many years with no additional investment. And that saves time and money in filter replacements that other water filters require and are even powerful enough 
off to purify treated, untreated, or even stagnant pond water. As always, all orders over $50 are shipped free, and GCN listeners get 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Order online at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com, spelled Big, B-E-R-K-E-Y, WaterFilters.com, or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-B-E-R-K-E-Y. Gift well this Christmas. Give a Big Berkey water filter. Solar power. Solar power. Hand crank power. Hand crank power. Radio power. Radio power. The goods you want, the good deals you need to power up your survival are at 21stCenturyGoods.com. In our solar department, you'll find solar generator kits, solar lanterns, flashlights, radios, and solar cell phone and laptop chargers. 21stCenturyGoods.com is your hand crank headquarters for everything from generators to flashlights to emergency, weather, and shortwave radios by Grundig and Cato. Big brand names and big deals. Like this. Get a free solar flashlight with every order over $75. But hurry, offer ends soon. Go to 21stCenturyGoods.com. Spelled the number two, the number one, S-T, CenturyGoods.com. That's 21stCenturyGoods.com. Or call 866-999-8422. 21stCenturyGoods.com. Power up your survival. This is Leslie Kane, and I'm with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and you are listening to the Paracast. With Lauren Coleman of the International Cryptozoology Museum, with Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. And so, as far as Lauren Coleman is concerned, we're not talking about interdimensional creatures. We're talking about creatures that are here, and maybe for whatever reason, we haven't looked in the right places. Is that part of it? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, in one of the one of the paradoxes of this is that you don't find something you don't look for. A lot of people, a lot of scientists. Uh, for instance, the largest new animal that was discovered in 2010 was a six and a half foot long uh, giant monitor lizard in Luzon, Philippines, that climbs trees and eats fruit. The native peoples have been saying. There's a big lizard around here. There's a big lizard around here. The scientists didn't believe them, so they didn't even start looking for it until 2003. In 2003, 2004, they finally started coming across solid evidence of this giant, uh, over-man-sized creature uh, called, you know, a monitor lizard. And when they finally discovered this, they said, oh, my goodness, it must have been here all the time. We just weren't looking in the right places. And that is exactly what happens over and over again. Uh, you know, the native people say it's there. Scientists come in and they, uh, for instance, the Okapi, this this giraffe-like uh, forest giraffe that was discovered in 1901 in Africa, the Europeans came through there and talked to the pygmies and said, no, you don't have any animal like that. What you're obviously seeing is a zebra in your rainforest. And the pygmy said, no, no, we think we're seeing something something different. Finally, in 1901, you know, an Englishman named Sir Harry Johnston uh, got some skulls and got some bandoliers and belts and sent them back to London and actually proved that there was a brand new animal there, the okapi. And it happens over and over again. Is that part of the problem here is that science wants to believe in any particular era that they know everything? We have discovered exactly. all the animals. We know what's going on. We know everything that's happening out there. There are no mysteries. Therefore, there can be no creatures that we are not quite aware of. Exactly, exactly. And and that's what uh, what is is now just as oftentimes you, you have uh, scientists who have degrees and go to universities. And I mean, I taught at a university for 20 years, so I'm no... I know what I'm talking about because I've been around these people. They think they're on the inside and they know it all, and yet you have amateurs come along who are cryptozoologists who maybe have been out in the field for 25 years and they're covered in mosquito bites, but they say, you know, I have this proof, and they come along and they said, no, no, you you can't have proof because there's nothing like that exists. And so now what's intriguing is you have a whole new category of debunkers and skeptics who are amateurs also, and it's almost like the religious right. They're coming up and they're saying, no, you know, what you're seeing here are bears in the woods or everybody's been drinking at Loch Ness. 
it almost beca- it's gone overboard into the ridiculous to really keep the status quo at a space and say everybody's uh, making these creatures up, they're all mythical, and then all of a sudden whenever uh, a giant monitor lizard is uh, discovered in 2010, they act like uh, somebody surprised them and, and tricked them or something. So these creatures have always been there, but they're using tunnel vision. Yes, yes. The the, the skeptical uh, individuals and uh, some of the academics. But what what is an interesting to me is when I started in this 51 years ago, uh, Sanderson once told me he thought there was about five of us in the United States that were interested in, in these kinds of animals. And then it got more, uh, you know, into the 60s, into the 70s. And what I'm finding nowadays, uh, I have coming into the museum all the time, different academics, different uh, biology teachers, kindergarten teachers, uh, law enforcement individuals, game wardens. And I said, how long have you been interested in cryptozoology? And they said, oh, it started for me when I was 25, which could have been 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago when I was watching In Search Of or, or I read your book you know, back, back in the day. And it's, it's so amazing to me that so many people are sort of on the inside now. We have law enforcement people, we have academics, we have, you know, people that are actually getting the frontline reports now and feeding them to some of us. And so it's really changing around and the world is, is like opening up to cryptozoology. And, and when you start seeing, you know, beef jerky commercials with Bigfoot in it, you know that the popular culture is kind of... Right. Um, Messing with you know, us. <laughs> right. It's 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 catching up finally, and you don't feel so alone. And so it's kind of times are changing. Right. Harry and the Hendersons. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All of those popular cultural items. Of course, that's warm and fuzzy Bigfoot. Yeah. Well, the warm and fuzzy Bigfoot, and then and then you have the Loch Ness monster. I call them the the big three celebrities. There's the abominable snowman, the the Yeti. The Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and the Loch Ness Monster are really driving what most people see as cryptozoology. Uh, one of the things that I, I really point out at our International Cryptozoology Museum, at any one time around the world, there's probably 200 expeditions looking for all kinds of different creatures that you wouldn't even know about, you know, like the, the Tazo worm, which looks like some kind of lizard in the Alps or or, you know, other creatures like uh, Mapaguari, which is a giant ground sloth of South America, or e- even the reopening of, of our case files on the little people after Homo forensis, the, the hobbits were discovered in Indonesia in 2003. Then you, you're starting to relook at the Minahuni stories, which are the little people of Hawaii. And um, I don't think we've quite opened the book on re examining leprechauns yet. But in the South Sea Islands, some of those old anthropology case files where you have reports of only 100 years ago saying that they were that the villagers were having fights with the little people and putting them in caves and, and putting uh, burning bushes in the front of the caves so that they killed all the little people because the tribal groups were afraid of the little people. We're re- reexamining some of the stories because they may have a, a grain of truth to them. And, uh, so right. That reminds me of a case that uh, occurred around the turn of the century. I think it was in 1902. Uh, was featured in, uh, I think, uh, some New Mexico scientific journal. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure the details escape me, but it it had to do with the Picturus Pueblo being attacked by a small, diminutive, uh, very nasty, like dwarf types, and they actually had to call in warriors from another, uh, I think, adjoining nearby Pueblo to help fight these uh, creatures off. And this, this whole thing was stated very matter-of-factly in, uh, in, in some sort of eth- ethno, uh, New Mexico Journal of Ethnology. Or, or, I forget the, the name of the actual publication, but it, I was quite surprised to see that so recently, that claims like this were taken seriously by, by, the, uh, by the officials there in New Mexico. So there's another example. But yeah, isn't it also story. true here that the locals will tend to know about things like this. They'll take it seriously. But those big city folk, the scientists, they come over and they don't know. So they look down upon the local people. Exactly, exactly. The six-foot-tall diurnal mammal that comes into your village 
and thinks that he can he or she can tell you what exists and doesn't exist. I mean, uh, who, who knows? Who knows? You know, people see things that other people don't, and uh, um, whether they're Bigfoot or little people or giant snakes or whatever, uh, just because they're city folks and they have a degree behind their name doesn't mean that they know everything. That's for sure. Yes, yeah, don't tell them that, though. Right. Well, sometimes yeah. it causes tunnel vision. You assume you know everything, therefore, when something happens that's anomalous, you are too prepared to dismiss it. Right. I think, luckily, in the fifth grade, I believe it was, I, I used to, I lived in Illinois, and I, uh, we would go to a, a day camp every day during the summer, and one of the chores was to uh, name all of the birds in the wood, wooden area that we were visiting. I excelled at that. I, I identified all the birds, and I knew all the birds. And uh, It was a little bit before the fifth grade, and I, I came home, and I started reading other books, and I was shocked to find out there were all of these other birds all over the world that I didn't know the names of because I thought I had identified every bird in the world because I'd, I'd uh, you know, named every bird uh, in Spitler Woods in, in Illinois. And it was just, it was kind of very revealing and it shook me up for a while, but it was a good lesson to have very early. So the key is yeah. here is don't assume you know everything because something is going to happen that's going to surprise you. Well, shake your world up unless you have a, a narcissistic personality and, and nothing will ever shake you up because you still think that you're the center of the universe, which does occasionally happen. Makes it real difficult. By the way, the yeah. place is called the International Cryptozoological Museum, and the proprietor in chief is Lauren Coleman. You're talking with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the People grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit, then carding to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. With Gene and Chris, the long-awaited return visit from Lauren Coleman. Now, Lauren, just to segue very quickly here, you very recently moved your museum? Yeah, I, uh, a short brief history of the museum is... I started collecting materials and going on expeditions in 1960. Some people who like to use a lot of adjectives have often called me the world's leading living cryptozoologist. Well, one of the most important phrases in there to me is that I'm living. And so that's always been very important to me. I'm still that's, living. That's a good <laughs> and I decided, That's a good start. Yeah. Why, why don't I start? organizing my collection before I'm dead and sharing it with people because, you know, documentary film companies and researchers were coming around. So I organized and founded the museum in 2003. I was in the middle of an ongoing 10-year divorce in which I finally bought a house and I decided, well, I'm going to buy a bigger house on the advice of my accountant to buy a bigger house and do the whole first floor as a museum. 
So I set up the museum in my home, four and a half rooms in my home downstairs. And, you know, I'd have unsolved mysteries and weird travels and all kinds of different programs. Deep sea detectives would come and film there. And they were delighted because I had different rooms set up for different, uh, you know, Africa room, a Victorian room based around different discoveries in cryptozoology so they could film without them having to change things. And, of course, I had many, many props because they were real artifacts from expeditions. Finally, in 2009, I was invited. A, a, a friend of mine was opening a bookstore, and in the back of the bookstore was a kind of a very large room, and she said, you have been wanting to have a public presence to this, so why don't you move your museum to my the back of my bookstore, put the Bigfoot that I have, which is an eight-foot-tall, 400-pound Bigfoot replica up at the front of her store, draw people into her bookstore, and then they would also occasionally come into my mu museum. We moved in there, and we found out oh, within a year it was too small. I had over 3,000 artifacts squeezed into this uh, 500 square feet, less than 500 square feet. And so it took us a while, but at the two-year mark, we moved a month ago to this space that's uh, over 2,000 square feet. It's it's just enormous. It's an old fur company uh, showroom, uh, w one room and then another attached room with windows all around. It's an old atrium, so unfortunately, it's 100 years old, so there's a roof over it now, but it's got a very tall ceiling. And, you know, we have a... The, the full-size Bigfoot, we have a full-size coelacanth, which is five and a half feet long. We have a 14-foot-long a uh, model of uh, the Colossus Squid. We have a model of the Mega Mouse Shark. And I have like 150 casts in, in display case and skulls and uh, Yeti material, hair sample, fecal material, uh, a cat area, a Loch Ness lake monster area, sea serpent, and that's just in the, the evidence room. And then in the outer room, it's a popular cultural and art-inspired materials out there, like we have the, the jackalope, a uh, full-size, uh, the prop from the movie P.T. Barnum, uh, the Fiji mermaid that's three and a half feet tall, uh, Laura Lenny shirt and hat from the Mothman Prophecies because I actually uh, consulted to that movie. Uh, items of chupacabras, uh, items from uh, De Jersey Devil, the Dover Demon, and the uh, the foot from the Terror of Turner, which was a, a case up here in Maine of a creature that was found. And there was a, a worldwide uh, interest in it. It was sometimes called the Maine Mutant anyway. I've got the foot in a little jar, and that gets a lot of attention. So uh, it just was really nice to move into this new space because we really have room to stretch our legs. And when groups of people come through here, they they have plenty of room. And it, it's just, uh, you know, today we had everybody from uh, a couple of zoologists from Florida and uh, a man from England who was a zoologist, a school teacher, a midwife, an artist, a, a potter, you know, construction workers, truck drivers. Everybody in the world who's heard about and been reading about cryptozoology, or they just are on vacation, and we're now on all of the top list of places to go in in Portland, Maine, and so it's it's just a a, a kind of a mecca for people to come see. Now, At understand of, here, it's not free. You're charging a modest admission fee. Oh, modest, yeah, five dollars for kids, seven dollars for adults. Yeah, mm -hmm. very modest, and uh, you know, people can take all the pictures and stay as long as they want. As as my docents often tell me, I'm one of the major attractions. Right behind the fact that we do have a restroom, me being a, one of the exhibits and being here is gets a lot of attention too. So you find people coming from all over the world to talk to you? Oh, yeah, all over the world. There was one man who was, he came all the way from Sydney, Australia to a business meeting in Boston. He got on a train in Boston, came up to the railroad station here in Portland, walked from the railroad station, which is a, about a mile and a half, to the museum, went to the museum, took all kinds of pictures, talked to me for a while, walked back to the train station took the train back to, to Boston. There's people from, we had a person from Tibet, we've had people from New Zealand, Australia, 
when we opened downtown in 2009, on opening day, we had 82 people show up. When we reopened, we had a grand reopening a month ago, the day before Halloween, 162 people came here, and really from all over. People people drove up from Baltimore. People came from uh, Connecticut, Boston, all over Maine. It, it was quite exciting, and, and uh, you know, it's one of those places that people— I remember at the end of October, it was the last couple— that had came to the old museum when it was around the corner in the Littlewer space. And they said that they'd just flown in from Madrid, Spain. They heard me on a podcast over in Spain and they had just got married. They were on their honeymoon in new England. And the first place they wanted to come <laughs> was to this museum. And, I love it. And, and, and it was so, the nation for honeymooners. Yeah, exactly. Well, you maybe you need had... to work with the travel agencies here and develop a package. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was remarkable, that was couple number 11 in two weeks that said they were on honeymoon and had stopped at the museum during their honeymoon. That's a little so was, scary, Lauren. Yeah, it was kind of very uh, bizarre. And there was actually one couple that came through about a year ago and they were fascinated by the fur-bearing trout. Took all kinds of pictures, asked me a lot about it. And then a month after they left, I got this postcard. And they said, we're still on our 33rd uh, honeymoon, anniversary honeymoon. And we're up in Alaska, and we found a fur-bearing trout, a uh, salmon. And here's the postcard for your collection. That was really strange, but it was very much appreciated. Fur bearing trout. Hmm, that's an interesting one. I, I think that's uh, that's a new one for me. We can't say it's anything fishy. Uh huh. Yes. Well, it's right in the same category. It's right on the wall next to the jackalope and jackalope. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, before we right. go into the next segment, we have some questions from our listeners because we basically anticipated your appearance and opened up a thread at the Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. And that is here in looking at this stuff. And you screened out all the ones from my ex-wives, right? Well, yeah. n- not really. I don't think oh, we know okay. who your ex-wives are. How many ex-wives do you have? I'm afraid to ask. Uh, just two. Oh, okay. Just two. I have That's one, but bad. she's basically a decent person. So if she posts a message, we would allow her to have that courtesy. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I, uh, my, my approach with ex-wives are that they actually are decent face-to-face, but behind your back they're telling incredible stories about you. As long as those stories are true, it becomes fun. <laughs> but it, my experience of learning what has been said has not been true. <laughs> we have Lauren Coleman of the International Cryptozoology Museum. We're not broadcasting this to any of his ex-wives. You're talking to Gene and Chris. You're in. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Fate Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fate Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Gold isn't for you? Ted Anderson, president of Midas Resources, one of the world's premier gold and precious metal investing firms. I get it. You wouldn't buy gold if you believed that the government is doing a great job, that the Fed will stop handing out trillions of dollars like bailout candy, that Social Security would be there for you. That's not what's happening. You might even pass on gold if the stimulus package wouldn't fuel inflation, or that the dollar wouldn't lose value, or that your retirement would be secure. If all looks rosy to you, then now is not the time to buy gold. 
goal. For the realists, there have never been more sobering reasons to diversify with gold. Since 2001, the U.S. dollar index has tanked 30% while gold has risen 300%. Right now, savvy investors are adding gold to their portfolios. You should, too. Find out what they know. Call us and I'll send you 10 reasons why gold will do very well, free. 800-686-2237. 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. The perfect water for drinking, bathing, and cleaning right at your fingertips? Yes, you can now have the most powerful water ionizer on the market for less than half the price of competitors. The Genesis Platinum Water Ionizer from Gibson'sHealth.com creates the perfect drinking water of 9.5 pH, automatically cleans every time you use it, and even tells you when to change filters. Other 7-plate water ionizers are priced at two or even $3,000, but the Genesis Platinum is only $16.95. Get yours today at Gibson'sHealth.com. Under Nutritionals, be sure to click on Essential Oils for Aromatic Liquids extracted from a broad range of flowers, stems, seeds, and bark. And to really balance your body, click on Go Green, the most complete green drink available, necessary for survival. All this and more are found at gibsonshealth.com. Call 800-388-6844. That's 800-388-6844 or gibsonshealth.com. Healthful living since 1974. If you owe the IRS money you can't pay, then listen carefully because you already know that the problem won't go away by itself. You can get help today from the leading tax expert in the country, Dan Pilla. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. The IRS isn't going to just forget about you. Right now, the IRS is hiring thousands of tax collectors to go after delinquent accounts just like yours. That's why you need to take action today, and I can help. I take a simple but proven approach to solving your tax debt problem. First, I stabilize collections so you don't have to worry about wage and bank levies. Next, I build a detailed plan to get your debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even eliminated. Finally, I work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. So call now for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. Dan Pilla will solve your tax problem guaranteed. He's helped thousands of people, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800-346-6829. That's 800-34-NO-TAX. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com that's theparacast.com or check us out at iTunes we have Lauren Coleman places to the International Cryptozoology Museum he's dealing with strange creatures that are indigenous to earth they're not from outer space not from another dimension they're here now briefly before you were talking about the Loch Ness Monster of course that's one of the classic strange creature stories so what is a Loch Ness Monster? Is that some remnant of the dinosaur era? No, unless you're British, it is. Uh, I mean, there is a real breakdown in the theories between the British and the Americans. The British really be- uh, tend to consider the Loch Ness Monster and other related lock and lake creatures from the northern hemisphere as plesiosaurs. Plesiosaurs, of course, are these long-necked marine reptiles that people often mistakenly call dinosaurs. They're not dinosaurs. They're just a prehistoric marine reptile. But if you take your arm and you go back and forth like a little S, you can see that that is the way that the neck of a reptile and a fish moves through the water. But if you go up and down, like through the, uh, the way that these animals are really moving through the water, like a dolphin, uh, like a whale, like a seal jumping in the water. That's the way that these lake monsters and sea serpents are actually moving. And they also, the reports are that they have whiskers, they have eyebrows, they have manes, they have beards on the males. These are all characteristics, what the Americans keep pointing out, characteristics of mammals. Mammals don't need, you know, a landlocked lake 10,000 years old to survive. They just probably communicate back and forth between the ocean 
and Loch Ness, for instance. Loch Ness is only six miles from the ocean, and actually one of the hidden secrets about Loch Ness is there's 40 good land sightings of these creatures crossing the road, coming up on the shore, doing things that you would expect from a sea elephant, a walrus, a giant, a seal. Many of these kind of creatures really are considered as part of the theories of most American cryptozoologists. We tend to think that they're mammals, they're warm-blooded, you know, they're able to survive in these large, cold northern lakes. If they were marine reptiles, they would have had to be around for 65 million years. They would have to have a warm-bloodedness, which is not a certainty with the plesiosaurs. And they would have to move in a different way, and they would have had fur on their scales instead of what we think is just a, a kind of more like a snake or lizard skin. A real difference there between Americans and the British. Do you think there's a there's some sort of relationship, commonality between, let's say, you know, Nessie, the Loch Ness monster, and then other lake creatures uh, like Champy and and the one up in um, in Canada? I forget the name that they've ascribed to. Pogo Pogo, Pogo yeah. Pogo, and Caddy, and all of those. Ivan Sanderson uh, looked at the lake monster reports, and I mentioned this in my field guide to Bigfoot. If you take a, a globe of the world and you put your fingers on the top, actually the kind of the lower part of Canada and the northern part of the United States, and you take those fi your fingers or a ruler or some kind of instrument and go right around the world, all of the lakes in the northern hemisphere are in a small band. And Ivan Sanderson called these the monster latitudes. All of the lakes in those areas and around the world are usually in boreal forests. So northern Russia, Siberia, Scandinavia, Scotland, Ireland, right around the world into Asia, into uh, North America, you have these lakes, deep water lakes. You know there's enough water in Loch Ness to cover everyone on Earth under six feet of water. It is that massive a lake, 1,000 wow. feet deep, 23 feet long, and it has that much water in it. I mean, it's just amazing. People don't realize how much water these lakes have in Anyway, if you look at all those lakes right around the northern tier of the world, they have similarities. They have similarities in, in the habitat, in the temperature, in the depth. Uh, and then if you look at the creature reports, they all tend to move like uh, dolphins through the water or seals up and down, up and down. And that's why you get this kind of mythical notion that these animals have coils. It's not so much that they have coils, but they're moving through the water in that way so that the artist, you know, artistic um, motif really started drawing sea serpents and lake monsters that way as if they had these co uh, coils. And it's not so much the coils, but it's the way they move. And so, uh, yes, I think there's a lot of commonality. I'm not sure. You know, obviously, that's a large area around the world, so there could be different species. There could be different subspecies. But in general, my whole one of the theories that I've been very attached to over the years is that you have a giant seal with a long neck, and that the males look a little bit different than the females. So the males have much more hair on their body, much more whiskering and mane and different things like that. The females look, uh, you know, similar shapes, but a more streamlined and smaller body so that some people think that they're two different kinds of animals, and I think it's just sexual dimorphism. Mm, interesting. Well, uh, so I do think that the water horses is a, a better than lake monsters or sea serpents. I think we're talking about water horses all over the world. And uh, it's a nice name because, uh, you know, it's kind of like sea lions and... Uh, uh, Kelpies. Um, Kelpies, yes. Kelpies, except Kelpies has a real, uh, you know, connection to Scotland, Ireland. So uh, water horses, if we're going to speak in English, it can be used around the world in a nice way. So have you guys been to Scotland? Well, I haven't. My son I, has. I haven't made it up that far north. I've been to Ireland but not, not, um, and okay. to central England, but I haven't made it up north north of there. Well, I, I did I uh, a two-week expedition in 1999. I gave the first 
keynote at the first international cryptozoology symposium at Loch Ness in, in 99 in July. And uh, it was just a, a great experience. I mean, to, to go to a place that had two Loch Ness monster museums within one block of each other, certainly in 99 inspired me to, to really get it together to have my museum become a reality because uh, Loch Ness really, for me, was the epicenter of cryptozoology. I think a lot of very open-minded people, and, and, and certainly they understand echo or what I now call crypto tourism, that in all of these spots around the world, uh, there are different sightings, different kinds of creatures. And if you're going to, you know, you're going to be there and understand that tourists are going to come there and ask you questions, you might as well be pre prepared with your souvenirs and your, uh, you know, Loch Ness plates or tea towels or whatever it is, because uh, Loch Ness has certainly made money. You know, Roswell made money. Mothman in Point Pleasant is certainly trying to keep some of these dying little communities alive with crypto tourism. So there's no reason that other people around the world shouldn't do that. And we have Lauren Coleman with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack, Attack. of the Rockwell. Rock the former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans the galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack, Attack. of the Rockoids Rock is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack, Attack of the Rockwell, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. Has the United States been discovered in the Bible? Where does Islam fit in Bible prophecy? Is the new world order world government? These and other crucial end time questions are answered in the new DVD package, Understanding the End Time, from End Time Ministries. Jesus Christ said, I tell you these things before they come to pass, so that when they do come to pass, you might believe. After you watch this 14-lesson DVD series, Understanding the End Time, you'll know more about Bible prophecy than the average seminary graduate. This DVD package normally sells for $280, but now is only $199. Order Understanding the End Time DVD package at endtime.com today for only $199 or call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. 1-800-363-8463 or InTime.com. Introducing a Diabetes Breakthrough, an easy, natural, organic way to bring relief to diabetics. Introducing MDS Forte, a concentrated super strength extract formulated for those who are looking for relief. What can MDS Forte do for you? MDS Forte reduces glucose levels safely and effectively, reduces cholesterol and triglyceride levels, increases HDL or good cholesterol while reducing LDL or bad cholesterol. MDS Forte reduces A1C, improves eyesight and circulation to the limbs, and helps with weight loss. Is non-toxic, caffeine-free, 100% natural, 100% organic, and comes with a 100% money back guarantee waiting for the side effects disclaimers with mds forte there are none order a 25-day treatment of mds forte by calling 213-405-5355 213-405-5355 or visit bestbloodsupport.com that's bestbloodsupport.com for mds forte a diabetes breakthrough smokers are you still smoking traditional cigarettes? Are you still smelling up your clothes and car interior, staining your teeth, and getting ashes everywhere? Why? 
when you could be smoking or vaping with e-cigarettes by LaSig. With LaSig e-cigarettes revolutionary microelectronic technology, rechargeable battery, and unique replacement cartridges, you'll get all the satisfaction of smoking, but no smoking hazards. Choose from a wide variety of our new American-made Vapriate e-liquid flavors at LaSig.com, spelled L-E-C-I-G.com, or call 870-518-4307. That's 870-518-4307. LaSig e-cigarettes for today's modern smoker. Warning, e-cigs may contain nicotine, an addictive substance known to the state of California to cause birth defects or cancer. Please be aware of the risks associated with e-cigs prior to use. You must be 18 years or older to purchase. This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. With Lauren Coleman, with Gene and Chris on the Paracast, we're exploring the tourist places. Now, the problem, of course, is when you have these various locations... Do you think some of them kind of sacrifice accuracy and scientific realism in order to make those fees? Well, I think that, I, you know, I certainly uh, know that one of the things that Bernard Hoyleman said is when humans encounter new animals, there's a period uh, in which the animals become fantastic. So in some ways that, actually happens in museums too. When you get somebody through the door and you want them to learn scientifically, scholarly, educationally, you're also going to have to take into account that one of the first questions that they're going to ask is, do bumbles bounce? Or are all snowmen white? Or do you think the Loch Ness Monster eats sheep? Or why couldn't the chupacabras be real and be vampires sucking blood from all the goats in South Florida? So if you're going to understand the general public and that that's where the general public is, you're going to have to be responsive to that in almost an over-exaggerated way because museums are not stupid and they know that they need to be entertaining or people will not keep coming back to learn. And I think we learned that about TV you know, even the, the best documentaries on TV are not the ones that are are very boring. Um, you know, they have good music, they have good visuals, and all of those things. So, yes, I think there's a, probably some of the museums are worse than others. Uh, for instance, if you go to the two in Loch Ness, one of them is very, very old, uh, cold and drafty. But one of the fascinating things about that is it's built around a very old Victorian-looking theater. So you go into it, and they, you know, there's all of these old wooden seats in this theater, and then up on the screen they start showing a 1933 movie of the Loch Ness monster. It's fascinating, and it couldn't happen at a better, better kind of location. Then you go across the street, and for about it seemed like four times as much admission. You're drawn into this place, and it has laser lights, nice charts, and a lot of electronic equipment, and yet you don't get as good a feeling there because they're trying to tell you in that other museum, the one with all of the technology, that we shouldn't really worry about the Loch Ness Monster because that's not the important thing that we want to talk about to you today. We want to talk about the ecology of the lake and how we want to save the fish, and we don't really think the Loch Ness monster even exists. Yeah, and they probably have T-shirts that say, "I I came and saw Loch Ness, and all I got was a bottle of single malt Highland Scotch." <laughs> well, what was funny is that I had along on that expedition my two sons at at seven and and twelve and seven and eleven or something. Anyway, uh, one of, my youngest son, we went through this whole exhibit really hot, snazzy, $4 million museum, Uh, all the right bells and whistles were going off. And it were dumped out into the largest souvenir shop I'd ever seen. And my little son, Caleb, looks up at me and he says, Dad, they just told us 
we weren't supposed to believe in the Loch Ness monster, and they want us to buy all of these things. And it was it's like, like from the, well. <laughs> yeah, the mouths of kids come the reality and the truth of it. And it was just, it's so true. Uh, it was just kind of the contradiction. Yeah, it's something that we uh, we wrestle with here on the Paracast uh, weekly is the pop culture view of a lot of the subjects that we cover, including cryptozoology. There's people that uh, are serious investigators and researchers that are out there in the trenches, and then there's others trying to capitalize on public perceptions of these subjects. Right, right. Well, I try to be someplace in between. I'm not really out to capitalize, but I want to I want to help educate people with the museum, and I know that. I have right. to be, you know, aware that people are going to come in and want to, you know, if it's a certain group of people, they're going to say, where's where's the Mothman material? Where's the Chupacabra material? And I say, over there. And that, well, where's all your, your Bigfoot toys? And I have a whole cabinet of popular cultural items that, that have, you know, even the one from uh, Six Million Dollar Man, because people look for those things. And that's their experience of Bigfoot. And then from there... They can branch out and learn more about the Patterson film, more about the Grays Harbor Bigfoot series of tracks that are some of the best tracks in the country. You know, different things like that. But Grays Harbor, Washington. Washington State, yes. Yeah, yeah. Was that the 1918 sighting? That one. 1982, yeah. Oh, in '82. Okay, because my yeah, grandfather 82. told me about one in 1918 that was quite quite amazing. It was right there. Yeah, the, uh, oh. the Ape Canyon one in 1924 is pretty famous and well-known where a tribal, seemingly a tribe of Bigfoot uh, threw rocks at a bunch of miners. And scared hey, you know, one people. thing that I've, I've uh, encountered on a number of occasions, uh, having a lifelong interest in the subject of Bigfoot in Sasquatch and growing up in Washington State, um, I even might have had a, an encounter myself, um, but I've talked about it on the show a number of times, so I won't digress, but one thing that I've heard uh, is that there's supposedly a, a really super remote valley uh, that's very difficult to get into right in the heart of British Columbia where there seems to be an enclave of these, of these hominids. So have you ever encountered a story like that where there seems to be a centralized location in British Columbia where these things, uh, there's quite a number of them? Have, have you ever heard anything like that? You, you might be talking about the Nahant Valley. The Nahant Valley is also called the Headless Valley, and that has a, a long, long tradition of some strange stories come from, coming from there, like people finding alligators there, uh, people going into the valley and disappearing, and then their bodies uh, being found against trees without their heads on their bodies, and then a lot of um, Sasquatch reports from that valley. So I, I think that sounds like, to me, what you're talking about, uh, a remote valley where people tell, you know, they go there looking for Bigfoot, looking for Sasquatch, and, and they end up dead. But there, of course, are all of these stories all over uh, the Yukon and uh, British Columbia of these different places that people say they see Bigfoot and yet they they never can quite find their way back there and, and certainly don't have evidence you know that they bring out one one feature that I've heard uh, in a couple of accounts uh, of this particular spot is that at the one entrance into this valley which is very as I mentioned difficult to get into um, are two huge full-grown um, conifers that have been pulled down and then lashed together, almost like in a McDonald's arches kind of motif, uh, as, as kind of a warning not to go in there. That's one detail that, that kind of has stuck in my mind over the years. But, you know, we've been talking a lot about Susquatch, and of course we've, we've dovetailed off into the, into the lake creatures, but before we get off the, the Bigfoot uh, subject, there's been a, a series of articles that have uh, appeared online here in the last couple of weeks that are, are attempting to debunk, yet again, the Patterson-Gimlin footage. And I think it, the detail that was uh, brought out in these articles, and I, I think I might have even read it on uh, Cryptomundo, is that, that the, the footage of him, of Patterson, making the actual plaster cast one of the tracks supposedly is missing. Do you, do you have any comments on, on that particular uh, analysis? Yeah, I think people are talking about reel number two where uh, Patterson, well, what Patterson did, uh, he actually, and he admitted this quite early on, it wasn't 
I mean, those were the early days, 1967. They found the tracks, but he also wanted to show uh, the his whole idea of making the Patterson film, the, the, the kind of get a little bit behind it, is that um, they had decided they were going to try to make a home movie slash documentary about going to find Bigfoot. So what they were actually doing that morning, they were out there trying to do B-roll, as we call it in the documentary film business. They were shooting background footage of the trees so that they could say, this is where you go look for Bigfoot. And I'll tell you and what, we got to look for this first. We have Lauren Coleman with Gene and Chris. You're in. There we Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Attention GCN listeners, do you have a Patriot on your Christmas list that's nearly impossible to shop for? How would you like the ability to get top-of-the-line, hard-to-find gifts at equally hard-to-beat prices without leaving the comfort of your home? Why fight the crowd? Simply log on to your computer for great gifts and deals for the -the off-the-grid enthusiast in your family. At offthegridchristmas.com, you'll find great prices on the most popular off-the-grid gifts available today. At offthegridchristmas.com, you'll find unbeatable deals on emergency backup power, herb and vegetable seeds, dehydrated foods, emergency evacuation packs, solar ovens, gun safes, and a host of truly unique stocking stuffers. In these hard times, why not give a gift that really counts, a gift that could truly make a difference? Go to offthegridchristmas.com and our Christmas video highlighting perfect gifts for the -the off-the-grid fans in your family. Unbeatable gear, unbeatable prices, no more searching. Offthegridchristmas.com, that's offthegridchristmas.com. If you constantly feel run down and tired, your pH level might be low and your body could be full of toxins. If what you drink is not at a pH level of 8 or higher, you are inviting bacteria and acid to thrive in your body. But there is something you can do. Simply add 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops to your water to help your body rid itself of acidic waste, increase oxygen, and raise your pH balance to optimum levels. AlkaVision Plasma pH drops combine a unique formula of the most alkaline minerals in the world. Alkalizing the water you you drink, ridding your body of acidic waste and toxins, and helping you regain energy and vibrant health. And studies show viruses, bacteria, and toxins cannot survive in an alkaline, high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops at AlkaVision.com. That's A L K A Vision.com. Or call 269 409 1776. 269 409 1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. What looks good under your Christmas tree and tastes even better? Big Berkey water filters. Yes, the gift of clean water. A gift that provides a great foundation for achieving good health in the lives of your loved ones. A Big Berkey water filter gives them protection from bacteria, heavy metals, chlorine, fluoride, pesticides and herbicides, VOCs and more. And best of all, a Big Berkey water filter is a gift that lasts for many years with no additional investment. And that saves time and money in filter replacements that other water filters require and are even powerful enough to purify treated, untreated, or even stagnant pond water. As always, all orders over $50 are shipped free, and GCN listeners get 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Order online at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com, spelled Big, B-E-R-K-E-Y, WaterFilters.com, or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-B-E-R-K-E-Y. Gift well this Christmas. Give a Big Berkey water filter. 
Hi, this is Ted Phillips listening to the Paracast, and it's as good as it gets, believe me. With Gene and Chris and Lauren Coleman, we're looking for Bigfoot, and we're looking for Bigfoot documentaries. What they did is they went out there and then accidentally found the Bigfoot, filmed it, and then they went back the next day because they were so scared of this, and they found the tracks. They're plaster, making plaster casts of the tracks. And in the B-row, what Patterson is doing, he creates a footprint himself over to the side and shows in a much more close-up filming, how do you pour the plaster into an imprint to make a big footprint? And so that's what a lot of people are getting confused about, is Patterson said, look, I did this as a film, you know, as part of the film. I wanted to show how to make a cast, so I made this footprint. I didn't want to ruin one of the real ones by, you know, if I made a mistake filling it full of this stuff and filming it and doing all of it. So he does this over to the side and people are saying, see, there's no prints there. There's no prints there. And so uh, people are getting confused about the continuity of the film, why he was doing this, for what reason. And uh, it's, you know, these, these old films are putting lines on them and they're Photoshopping them and they're moving things around. And they're, they're, it's, it's like the Zabruder film. They're coming up with conspiracies within conspiracies and and trying to and this is all out of the same people that said Patterson and Gimlin were there and did a massacre of Bigfoot and that they were really shooting up Bigfoot and trying to cover it up. So I'm very suspect of these new debunkers because I think they have other motivations. Under- well, where do you come down on the footage itself? Do you do you feel it's still uh, the best? visual evidence that we have, or do you think that there is a possibility of some sort of uh, nefarious you know, hoax going on? No, no, I, I'm, I'm pretty clear, and everything I've written and everything I've said is I'm 95% sure that this is the gold standard for proof if we, you know, obviously I'm never going to say it's 100% because if, um, you know, I wasn't there and I don't know, but I've interviewed Gimlin many times. I've looked at the film. I've I've, uh, you know, examined some of these theories where even within one book, there was two different possibilities for what the, I mean, the guy was riding along in the book and he said, this is definitely a horse hide fur, a red horse hide fur that they made into this Bigfoot, you know, uh, costume. And then later on in it, he says, um, you know, without even knowing that he wrote the other chapter, he says, this is definitely a, you know, Morris gorilla suit from uh, this Carolina guy. And it, it just totally, we called that book the tale of two suits because he just couldn't get his facts read. And, and you know, if you look at the film, and I have the enhanced version of the film in the museum, we can clearly see two independently moving breasts. You can see large hips. You see a, man, a mammalian feature of this female turning around and staring down these two guys. These, You know, Gimlin... I mean, he's a big horse wrangler, rough and ready kind of guy. He was scared to death that day. He said, we just didn't know she was going to tear us from limb to limb. There was no way we're following her into the woods. And we didn't hang around and make, you know, plaster casts of those footprints. We came back the next day and made sure she wasn't around. We were scared to death. And if you look at that film and you think about black bear and how black bear mothers scare away, you know, they leave an area, but as they're leaving, they're giving all kinds of mammalian intimidation behavior, staring the people down and saying, don't follow me. That's exactly what this Bigfoot does. Yeah, boy, it could be an angry ex-wife of some other Bigfoot. You don't want to mess around with uh, with something that's yeah. about twice as big as you. <laughs> exactly. Well, so far, of course, what we see about Bigfoot, it's always pretty pretty distant in terms of understanding how smart they are. So that's a good question here. Compared to humans, where do they stand? What sophistication do they display? Well, I mean, if you look at them uh, just baseline, they don't. They have no culture. Uh, they don't have libraries. They don't have cars. They don't seem to cook their food. They don't have. Uh, there's occasional reports of them taking lo- clothes from lines and maybe trying on uh, checkered shirts or you know things like that. Or really? in the north. Yeah, there's some reports. Never heard from, that before. That's an interesting little twist. 
Yeah, the same Naha area, Naha Valley area that the Bushmen that are reported that you were talking about earlier, they've been reported because it gets colder and colder up north to steal people's old boots and wear the boots. You know, actually, Dr. Carlton Kuhn, a a famous anthropologist who spoke at a symposium once in British Columbia, once said, you know, if the meek shall inherit the earth, it will be Sasquatch, because he said they're smart enough to not live in cities where there's smog. And so if you look at it from that perspective, all that we do to, you know, take care of ourselves, keep ourselves warm, uh, calm us, communicate, politics, whatever, there's no Herbert Cain among the Bigfoot. There's no, you know, Bill Riley in commentary and all kinds of things like that. Oh, so you, you you got a big, big gap there. Um, you basically have a hominoid animal in the woods, occasionally eating, occasionally being seen by humans, and most of the time, uh, you know, mating, having having offspring, defecating, and eating. Basic animal needs. And there's nothing wrong with any of those, but there's certainly not, there's nothing in that takes a conscious intelligence. You have unconscious survival drives that are, are motivating what we see from Bigfoot. Can I then tell you the IQ of them? Or do I know if they're psychic or tell, you know have telepathy or any of that? Of course not. We have absolutely no evidence. You have a few reports from a handful of Bigfoot contactees who say that they, you know they're standing on the edge of their farmland and they're taking in the thoughts of a Bigfoot. Now, I have no evidence that that's not some kind of pre-psychotic behavior or if the person is actually listening to Bigfoot. It, there's no measurable evidence that these creatures are talking to humans telepathically or with some kind of Indian language or any of that. So, uh, you know, a lot of people come in here and they think I'm a true believer. I never use the word believer. I'm uh, open-minded, but I'm skeptical all the time. Yeah, count me among that uh, <laughs> that crowd, too. I never use the B word or the P word, the prophecy word, prophesize or believe. I don't believe any of this stuff, but, boy, it sure is interesting. And uh, I think that a lot of the skeptics, debunkers, are just as bad as the true believers. Uh, the, the people that I feel most uncomfortable with in a room is is that two ends of the continuum, the true believers and the debunkers, because the debunkers come into all of these investigations completely closed-minded to any of the possibilities that these uh, species, these creatures could actually exist. Well, let's, uh, you know, since we're on the subject, we do have some questions from our forum Sure, that would be great. To, uh, to fire at you. And, you know, you have answered a couple of these, but um, Zylo wants to know, historically the majority of Bigfoot or Sasquatch sightings have been from the northwest region of North America. To what do you attribute the widespread sightings or reports that we've seen in modern times? That's one question that he has. The second question is, in cases of Bigfoot DNA evidence, when the evidence returns as unknown primate, have any researchers correlated the DNA profiles of these unknowns? Okay, the first question... Well, you have a lot of the copycat effect and the cultural, you know, osmosis. When you have such a high interest in Bigfoot, you're going to get all kinds of people saying they saw Bigfoot. I think that 80% of the sightings are misidentification. A large bear, the back end of a moose, your grandmother in a fur coat. I mean, I don't know. I talk about those grandmothers in fur coats that are mistaken for Bigfoot. (laughs) I think are we serious here? Time. No, Lauren, are we serious? I've heard lots and lots of possible uh, explanations, but boy, Lauren, that, that one, that, that's a new one on me. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. I have actually seen YouTube footage of a plane flying over a field, and it looks, upon closer examination, like somebody's grandfather or grandmother in a fur coat walking along the edge of a field with a walking stick. And somebody posted that on YouTube as saying, this is my Bigfoot film. And it, it, it happens more than you think. That, that's, you know, it really does. Anyway, so where was I? Uh, you know, so you've got all of these situations. The one thing that I think we're, we're kind of becoming more aware of 
is that if you remember living in the 50s and the 60s, every day you would pick up your newspaper and there'd be UFO sightings. They'd, they'd run them in the papers. And you just don't get that many anymore. What do you get? You do in the 80s and the 70s, you started getting people doing UF, from UFO then into Bigfoot. And so you get some of those sightings. You don't even have those sightings in the paper anymore. I Once guess it isn't weird them. enough. You want something that involves a politician because that's the weirdest thing of all sometimes. We have Lauren Coleman, who's definitely not weird, with Gene and Chris, who definitely are weird. You're in the Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. For our final home stretch of the show, four more segments with Lauren Coleman. He, of course, is proprietor and chief cook and bottle washer and the floor sweeper, right, of the International Cryptozoology Museum. Well, we use a vacuum cleaner, but yes. Okay. He's the floor <laughs> vacuum cleaner with Gene and Chris in the PowerCast. So is that the end of that particular question? Do we need to move no, to the No, I think one? there was a part two. What was the part two? Yeah, there was two? a part two Your about question? the DNA evidence. And, uh, okay, and, and so, okay so Chris, just briefly summarize part two of the question. Let's have the answer. Yeah, in other words, in cases of Bigfoot DNA evidence or potential DNA evidence, uh, when the evidence returns from testing as, quote, unknown primate, unquote, have any researchers correlated the DNA profiles of these unknowns? And if a DNA database could be created, wouldn't that be sufficient to establish a species profile in the scientific community? Um, yes, uh, yes, no. Um, what has occurred is that some scientists are correlating the DNA sampling that's going on and trying to show that there's some overlap. One of the problems there, of course, is we do not have a genome for a Sasquatch. So just because you get part B here and part G there and try to say that they belonged to the same animal, you're going to get different parts of the picture. And so then, you know, you're trying to correlate that, but it still would not be enough evidence because you don't have the type specimen to compare it to. So it's always going to come back a little short. Uh, right. I mean, after all, the human genome is the first one that we've really cataloged, and we don't even have the genome of a lot of other animals yet. Yeah. Um, well, you, here's another one. Now, you mentioned the copycat effect. This comes from our listener and poster, Thabtos. Could the copycat effect be applied to cryptids and other, or other paranormal sightings, for that matter? And he's putting the word paranormal in there. But does your research lead you to believe that reports of cryptid sightings occur in clusters? Yeah, I, exactly. And I actually, in my my book, The Copycat Effect, I start out in the beginning by talking about the waves of alligator uh, reports where alligators were fatally attacking people and the summer of the shark attacks. Uh, those kinds of things happen all the time, but when the media gets interested and starts publicizing things, then it actually creates artificial clusters and waves, and I've actually documented that in certain Bigfoot sightings, large snake sightings, 
other things where the media becomes interested and it becomes a artificial bump in the reports that have no uh, factual connection to reality. There, there doesn't it's mean the same that there's more victim cases. Around. I found the exact same thing. Yeah. Okay. It does happen. No. Well, what about high effect. strangeness cases? This one comes from JT. Of course, great Fortean showman John Keel tied Bigfoot with the paranormal. So does Stan Gordon and many others. We hear so many stories of glowing red eyes. How do you, as a scientist, reconcile such cases, especially when they come from reliable sources? And let me just dovetail into the Stan Gordon uh, part of this question. He does have a very interesting case that featured a Bigfoot in conjunction with a UFO landed in a, on a farm. Are you familiar with that case? Yeah, in which the, uh, the Bigfoot supposedly had a glowing ball in its uh, hands and it moved along a fence. Well, a lot of the Stan Gordon cases, a lot of the, as in my book about Bigfoot, I actually do a whole chapter on the high strangeness, and I look at that, and it all came out of a certain time, a little bit post-hippie, 1970s, all of the paperbacks were coming out, high strangeness cases. John Keel, who called himself not a ufologist, but a demonologist, he was a demonologist, and he felt that there was this overlap. It also sold books, and he was very honest about that. But I find that once you start looking at those high strangeness cases, they start falling apart, and they're a real reflection of the culture in which those stories came about. You know, there's even one report uh, from um, a certain woman in Nevada who says that there was a Bigfoot that was climbing uh, a ladder up into a UFO. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you can always find high strangeness cases, but it doesn't, once again, they're just stories. They're stories. And if we look a little bit deeper, it doesn't seem to be a really good testimony that leads us any places. It might be a great story, but where does it lead us? Certainly right. not towards any evidence, not towards any facts. Okay. Well, Snyder maybe Whiplash, who is a fairly recent um, addition to our community, uh, wants to know what your thoughts are in the recent Siberian expedition. And his second part of the question is, what kind of funding and logistics would it take to launch an investigation to truly unearth the mystery of Bigfoot? Okay. Well, uh, I saw from a distance, for one thing, I was invited uh, to go there, but uh, the an invitation was with the stipulation that I uh, spent several thousand dollars to go. And I said, you know, I'm setting up a museum. I don't have much money. I'm not going to spend money to and go to Siberia. Jeff Meldrum reports that when he went into that uh, the cave with the expedition, uh, they found footprints, but unfortunately they were all footprints of only one foot, uh, not a right foot and a left foot, but only only one foot. And, uh, and and he said that it was intriguing to him that all of the people that were behind this expedition and finding the hair and finding the footprints were all of the tourist people from the local city who had declared, uh, you know, a Yeti day and all of this. The, the expedition and that whole conference was baloney. It was just outright a tourist, you know, and as Jeff said, he will not be invited back because he said some rather scalding things about that whole experience. It was just a publicity event, and it really backfired for those people that it looked at it. Uh, yeah, it was a publicity stunt. Oh, boy. So what was the other question? I mean, we don't have any Tom Slicks out there to our knowledge. I mean, what's it going to take? Is it going to no, take the, uh... the funding? The funding, unfortunately, and uh, I have – and, you know, looked at this deeply because I, I did teach a documentary film course for 20 years at the university. Uh, the funding that is coming from uh, for cryptozoological excursions are from television and documentary companies. And how are they setting up this? They're setting it up by getting their sponsors to give them money, and then they fly somebody in for a day or two and fly them out. So you get great footage of somebody putting a trail cam around a tree, uh, looking at it the next morning and saying, whoop, no evidence of Bigfoot. Uh, they didn't come right. by here last night. It's just a joke. It's a joke. Yeah. It's a sad joke. 
Uh, and the real the real research is going on in Sumatra. Uh, Deborah Martyr, who's been funded by the Floral and Fauna International Society for 20 years, she's going to find evidence of the Rang Pindek. But it takes it takes the as long as it took to build the pyramids. You know, it's not going to happen in a weekend. The weekend warriors are not the way to go. Well, you mentioned trail cams. Uh, JT has a question here. What do you make of the recent findings that alpha male coyotes are aware of trail cameras and avoid them? For your average skeptic, that might seem he had another excuse for not finding the big-footed beast. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I definitely agree. I, I pointed that out a long time ago that I think that the, the higher abilities that some of these animals have to hear certain, you know, outside of our range to smell certain metals and oils that humans use. Coyotes are very smart. You know, they're a good canine, and there's no telling what kind of abilities that Bigfoot and other animals have to trail cams probably smell. They probably whiz. They probably make noises. And, and we act like we can just put them out there and everybody, every animal in the woods is going to come by them. It just They're going to wave. They want to have all that screen presence because <laughs> they are big egomaniacs. They want their 15 minutes of fame, and they're going to go out there and they're going to wave, hey, look at us, look at the earthlings. Reminds me of the crazy scene from Independence Day where, of course, Jeff Goldblum and Will Smith stand up in the spaceship so the alien can see us. Look at the earthlings. Look at that. Look at this. We're talking to Lauren Coleman. The place is called the International Cryptozoological Museum. You're with Gene and Chris because you're in the Paragon. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. Have you ever felt like the United States government knows way too much about your financial affairs? I continue to hear stories about property seizures, frozen bank accounts, confiscation of stocks and bonds. It makes me wonder if the U.S. citizen will ever again have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, with the Drug and Money Laundering Act, the IRS Revenue Ruling 6045 of 1984, and the Trading with the Enemy Act and Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order of 1933, some precious metal holdings are subject to government intervention. For this reason, Midas Resources has prepared a report explaining the boundaries of trading precious metals privately. Whether if you have any intention of trading with Midas Resources or not, I have instructed my representatives to give this report out free. Call for your free copy at 1-800-686-2237. When investing, always proceed with caution. Again, call 1-800-686-2237. Exercise your legal right to trade metals privately. 1-800-686-2237. Hey, everybody. Alex Jones here. If you're looking for the perfect Christmas gift, listen up. This will make your holiday shopping very easy. This year, give a seed bank from one of our oldest sponsors, Solutions from Science, to your friends and family. Here's why. The Survival Seed Bank will give any friend or loved one the ability to grow a full acre crisis garden of nutritionally dense, life-sustaining food. And the Survival Seed Bank is not just a box of open-pollinated seeds. It's an indestructible, waterproof seed bank that can even be buried if we face a real meltdown. And here's the best part. All the seeds in the Survival Seed Bank Go through strict germination testing so you can be confident you're not buying old seeds. Give a Survival Seed Bank this Christmas by going to survivalseedbank.com. That's survivalseedbank.com. Or you can call 877-327-0365 to give the gift that produces an ongoing supply of life-sustaining food. 
Solar power. Solar power. Hand crank power. Hand crank power. Radio power. Radio power. The goods you want, the good deals you need to power up your survival are at 21stCenturyGoods.com. In our solar department, you'll find solar generator kits, solar lanterns, flashlights, radios, and solar cell phone and laptop chargers. 21stCenturyGoods.com is your hand crank headquarters for everything from generators to flashlights to emergency, weather, and shortwave radios by Grundig and Cato. Big brand names and big deals like this. Get a free solar flashlight with every order over $75, but hurry, offer ends soon. Go to 21stCenturyGoods.com, spelled the number two, the number one, S-T, CenturyGoods.com. That's 21stCenturyGoods.com, or call 866-999-8422. 21stCenturyGoods.com, power up your survival. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. With Gene, with Chris, and Lauren Coleman on the Paracast, answering your questions. And we're talking about whether these creatures want 15 minutes of fame, and they just want to be left alone. And you know what happens to most of the trail camps? They're stolen by other humans. (laughs) So when they disappear, it's not "Mm, the creatures. Right. Bigfoot's working on his family photo album. Right. (laughs) Well, here's some questions from Digital Trickster. And uh, first of all, he says he's so glad that you... Uh, are back on the show. He's been waiting a long time to uh, to listen to you here. Have you heard of any possible dinosaur sightings lately? Uh, we did cover this with uh, with J.C. Johnson, who was a guest here a number of weeks back, and uh, that's part one. Part two is what is your opinion of the Mokili Mobembe? I'm not sure how to say that sighting. Mokili Mobembe. Yeah, Mokili well, Mobembe. Well, once sounds again, sounds like something uh, from The Lion King. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> I can hear James uh, Earl Jones saying this. Look really I uh, am your father. No. You guys, it's getting late in the show. You're falling apart there on me. So that's okay. <laughs> Having fun. Mokile Mabembe, dinosaurs. Once again, the perspective. The perspective, if you're a creationist, if you uh, think that there's dinosaurs in Africa, then every time there's a report of a large animal in Central Africa, sometimes in Central America, sometimes... Uh, pterodactyls in the United States, you feel that it's uh, evidence of dinosaurs. I tend to try to get away from the the religious perspective entirely and look at what people are saying they're seeing. What they're saying they're seeing is a large animal in the jungle that may actually not be a dinosaur, but be something like an aquatic rhino. And so, you you know, the, the skeptics always use Occam's razor, and they talk about, and usually to them that means it doesn't exist. But uh, the real concept is about you look at the most logical, mundane explanation. You don't go to dinosaurs being the final solution. You look at uh, maybe there's some other kind of mammal that's only been around and easier to explain as a possibility. And I think that there's probably a, a, an aquatic race of forest uh, rhinos that hasn't been caught yet, and that's what Mokilio Mbembe and a lot of these creatures may turn out to be. How about the river The river dinos uh, around Lake Powell, the San Juan River, uh, that area of southern Utah where over the years, there's been uh, uh, quite a number of fairly locally fairly celebrated reports of people seeing small three to four foot tall bipedal uh, dinosaurs running around, even in packs. Uh, have you done any sort of uh, research into that uh, whole thing? Yeah, phenomenon? yeah, I've heard about that, and it almost feels like they're little velociraptors and different things like that. Once again, it's it's eyewitness reports. Uh, I mean, I'm open minded to hearing more about it. It's just once again. It's sightings, and I mean, it, maybe it's some kind of birds, maybe it's some kind of uh, reptiles that really have hung around. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd like to hear more, and I'd like to see some photographs. Uh, 
just had two reports from Canyonlands last month. Two separate right. witnesses came forward and, and talked about this. And uh, there have been a number of these sightings over the years on the northern uh, side of Lake Powell. They're, they're also called, uh, they call them the river dinos, too, I think, in the area there. Um, well, yeah. moving along here. Well, Lake, Powell's, Lake Powell's awful interesting, too, because you have the giant beaver reports from there, too. So right, and also snakes, too, uh, from, from the San Juan uh, Basin area. J.C. Johnson kind of titillated our audience with a couple of, uh, well, one, one case uh, where he and his, one of his river guides actually experienced a huge coil of a snake came up, and uh, they estimated it was 18 inches in diameter, which is kind of hard to believe in that cold water. But, well, we've got, we've got inter- some other... It's an interesting area, that's for sure. And I really well, look is. forward to yeah, more yeah. researchers bringing stuff out of there. Yeah, it's it's a real it's a real interesting remote area of the country that um, is it's not that well explored. There's lots of areas that are 20, 30 miles from nearest jeep trail. Even here's one: uh, what cryptids uh, do you believe have the best chance of being found? It sounds uh, like you've kind of answered that. You think possibly Bigfoot would be be our our uh, most likely candidate for the best. No, chance actually, of being... actually, I think one of the best bets is uh, the Rang ben- Pendek which is this right. little three-and-a-half-foot, four-foot-tall creature in Sumatra, Indonesia. I actually think that Bigfoot's going to take a little bit longer, maybe another 25, uh, 40 years. But I think Orang Pindek, that will be the big surprise. I think they've already seen it. They found footprints. It's in a concentrated little area. They're going to get closer and closer and actually find physical evidence of this. I know that there's a lot of mutterings about DNA with Bigfoot, but I'm not sure that that's really going to come to any future, you know, future uh, excitement the way we're going to get more discoveries out of Asia that are going to really blow people away. Well, the, his second part of his question is, what, which cryptid do you wish would prove to be real but will probably never be found or have significant evidence to prove its existence? Which one well, do you uh, hope No, No, that's, to... that's a question like how many times a day do I beat my wife? Uh, <laughs> it, you, know, <laughs> oh. you know, what kind of creature will never be found but I'm really interested in? No, 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 I'm not going to. You're not going to go there, huh? <laughs> no, no I, I always have, it's all about accepting or denying the evidence. So I keep looking at the evidence and some of it I deny, some of it doesn't work out, but some of it is, is always a kernel of possibilities in that. So obviously I do not spend my time looking for unicorns and, uh, you know, fairies and, and different things like that, or all of those creatures that inhabit World of Warcraft. But, you know, for the rest of it, I think there's always a possibility there could be new species out there. Yeah, well, there's new species are discovered every every month. It's amazing, especially in oh, the ocean. Yeah. It's amazing how many uh, creatures are still, and in the Amazon uh, basin, I'm sure, there are just countless species. And New Guinea and Indonesia. And, and he, I mean, that's what cryptozoology is. We're out here to find new species, not to, to prove Bigfoot or to prove the Yeti or Loch Ness Monster exists. It's really about new species, and people get it confused. Uh, they think we're only, you know, only interested in Bigfoot. But it's amazing when they come into this museum and see all of the you know, animals that have been discovered that used to be unknown cryptids, you know, the polar bear, the Komodo dragon, the, the megamouse shark, the coelacanth, all of these creatures that are new and exciting and quite large. Okay, here's one from Almen. Lauren, have you ever had a rock thrown at you by Sasquatch? Uh, no, no. I haven't <laughs> even had a rock thrown at me by a human. So, well, you know what? Yeah. I guess we can get volunteers. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I like you. But, you know, they're crazy people out there. No, they want no, to throw actually, rocks that, at us, I, actually. I, I take that back. I take that back because I remember when I was a kid, I came home once with a uh, a bloody head, and my father said, what's that from? And they said, oh, we were just... Some kids and I were throwing rocks back and forth. It did happen when I was little. But, I no, I've never been out. I've heard Bigfoot screeches. I've found footprints. I've never seen a Bigfoot. Uh, I've never seen, uh, you know, a Loch Ness Monster or any of these creatures. And so, no, I've not been uh, thrown at by Bigfoot. So you're, you're like uh, good old Stanton Friedman who's never seen a UFO. But, boy, he's out there making sure everybody knows they're real. By the <laughs> way, we have Lauren Coleman. We know he's real. Gene and Chris, yeah. I don't know, because you're in... The Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. 
We are the GCN Radio Network. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com The perfect water for drinking, bathing, and cleaning right at your fingertips? Yes, you can now have the most powerful water ionizer on the market for less than half the price of competitors. The Genesis Platinum Water Ionizer from GibsonsHealth.com creates the perfect drinking water of 9.5 pH, automatically cleans every time you use it, and even tells you when to change filters. Other 7-plate water ionizers are priced at two or even $3,000, but the Genesis Platinum is only $16.95. Get yours today at GibsonsHealth.com. Under Nutritionals, be sure to click on Essential Oils for Aromatic Liquids extracted from a broad range of flowers, stems, seeds, and bark. And to really balance your body, click on Go Green, the most complete green drink available, necessary for survival. All this and more are found at GibsonsHealth.com. Call 800-388-6844. That's 800-388-6844. Or GibsonsHealth.com. Healthful living since 1974. Hi. I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Don't forget, CrossbreedHolsters.com. That's the sound of your door being kicked in by an intruder with a single kick. That's the sound of the same door now protected by the Door Sentinel at MySafeDoor.com. Go to MySafeDoor.com right now and watch the amazing video. At MySafeDoor.com, you'll learn how to turn your home into a fortress with the Door Sentinel. 16 kicks later, and the Door Sentinel is still holding strong. MySafeDoor.com. That's MySafeDoor.com. What nutrition are you missing that's leading to the four major diseases? Cancer, arthritis, heart disease, and Parkinson's. There are at least 80,000 medical studies that show a lack of the protein glutathione to be linked to cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's, macular degeneration, lung disease, digestive diseases, diabetes, Alzheimer's, ALS, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. In all, at least 68 diseases. What is the number one food by which your body is most empowered to increase its glutathione production? It is undamaged whey protein from grass-fed cows. One World Whey is truly the first undamaged whey protein. All other whey protein powders are damaged by heat, chemicals, and filtration. One World Whey is the most life-giving whey protein powder ever produced. Call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988-3325. Or visit OneWorldWay.com. That's OneWorldWhey.com. Hi, this is nuclear physicist lecturer Stanton Friedman. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Are we real? Are we Memorex? With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast, and we're having a great time answering your questions. We're at least letting Lauren Coleman doing the heavy lifting. We just sit back and listen. When you get people like Lauren, who's been there, done that two or three times, you know, that's where you go. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I was uh, helping uh, Sony Screen Gems with Mothman Prophecies, I actually did 400 radio interviews in three months. That was wow. heavy lifting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you were like were a movie star. Did you do shows. more interviews than John Keel? Well, John Keel was sick. And so John Keel did a couple of uh, visuals, you know, documentaries. But they said, 
Lauren Coleman, could you come on board and be our publicity guy and tell everybody that the Mothman movie is based on reality? And I said, okay, let's do this. Let's make this deal. And uh, we did it. And I wrote a book and made appearances and did a news conference in Hollywood. And they flew my boys out, too. And we got to see the X-Men being filmed and different things like that. It was quite a trip. It was, you know, those were the days when actually before the Depression happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you mentioned Mothman. Where do you come down on Mothman? Uh, Mothman, I think it's a large, uh, unknown owl. Uh, I think that uh, John Keel made uh, made it into uh, much more. Uh, demonology came into being. I interviewed uh, Linda Scarberry, for instance, and, and she was very specific. Uh, this is a woman who was a, one of the first eyewitnesses. After that, she said John Keel came into her house, and she said when John Keel left, he had her so scared, she put a cross on every wall in her house. And she went... <laughs> to keep him out from coming back? Or... Yeah, yeah, to keep the Mothman. And, well, and you know, they, with John well, Keel, I, I felt that way about John Keel sometimes. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he was the scary, crusty man with a sense of humor. But uh, yeah. so... You know, Linda Scarberry, she recently died at a, a relatively young age, and she went in and out of mental hospitals for most of her life. Before John Keel came into that situation, he went down there to look, look into stories of winged cats, you know, a Fordian phenomena. There were reports of farm cats that have wings on them, and he fell into the Mothman story, and he put it together in his books uh, with the psychics, that were showing up in Mystic Mountain around New York, and he mixed them all together, and it became a semi-fictionalized story that had men in black, UFOs, all kinds of things. But John knew very early on, and he would tell me this. He said, you know, I knew it was just a, a, a big bird, some kind of big unknown bird, and Ivan Sanderson and I were talking all the time on the phone about what it could be. And I talked to those eyewitnesses myself, uh, the original eyewitnesses, every one of them in 1966 described a large owl-like creature, no hands, no legs, no arms, no head. All of that came later, you know, 20 years later after the, the documentary film companies kept coming through there. I helped Sony Screen Gyms actually edit out one woman that they had on tape who was saying, oh, yeah, when I saw it, it had a big forked tail like the devil. And I said, you got to take her out of there. She's insane. Nobody ever said they saw anything like that. And what happened, of course, is that we know that a copy editor in an Ohio a newspaper did not like the name Big Bird, which was what was coming about. And he said, oh, I've got a better name for the headlines. He was a fan of the Batman series on TV, so he came up with the name Mothman. None of the eyewitnesses ever saw anything like a moth or a man. It was always Big Bird, Big Bird, Big Bird. And along came Mothman in the Ohio newspaper, and it caught on. The media madness began and everybody started calling up Mothman. And so if you go to Point Pleasant, you see the statue there. It's of a big insect um, in their town square. Absolutely looks nothing like what the eyewitnesses said the creature looked like. They said it looked like a big bird with feathers on it in which the eyes were in the uh, chest. And just to get back to one of your earlier questions, nobody ever said it had glowing eyes. All of the eyewitnesses said they were in their cars, the light would catch this bird, and it would reflect back just like those round reflectors that you put at the end of your driveway. And that's the way they described it. Years later, people would say these were, these were glowing red eyes and all of that stuff. Not at all factual. Yeah, kind of wonder in retrospect if that might have happened with Roswell, that when the memories came back, what, 30 years after the original event, suddenly more things happened that may have originally occurred? Exactly. I mean, I don't know. I'm not studied as deeply as I am about Roswell with the Mothman, but certainly I, uh, you know, I have actually practiced psychiatric social work, and I know recovered memories can be very elaborate. There's certainly there's a kernel of truth there, 
Uh, we all know that, and we also should not disregard abuse victims and trauma victims and all of that. But if you look at the Roswell situation, the Mothman situation, uh, the Flatwoods monster, all of those were traumatic events that people would remember in different ways based upon their own experience. And it would get more and more elaborate. And what happened with Linda Scarberry, already a very kind of delicate personality, let's say that, delicate personality... A camera crew comes in. She starts changing her story to fit their questions. Yes, it had legs. Yes, it had arms. Yes, it had glowing eyes. She never talked about that in the original time when she was talking and being interviewed. It all came out later. She talked about no legs. She drew she drew pictures back then that shows the Mothman the way that we know it, it was, which was a, like a giant owl with uh, eyes in its chest, which if you look in that owl, the eyes will look like it's in its chest because the way the ears go up, they look like they're part of the shoulders. But a gigantic owl, over and over again, six feet tall, this bird was described as, uh, by people, you know, police officers, housewives, mechanics, truck drivers, all kinds of people uh, that were really describing something that was huge. Yeah, but that's- Three times larger than the largest known owl species. I mean, what could that have been? Are we talking about some forty inch well, thing? There, paranormal? There, there are there are large owls. There's owls in the fossil record that are uh, four feet tall, and they were found in Cuba. And certainly, you know, a lot of the Thunderbird stories are the same ball of wax. I mean, just because uh, we don't have them in, in museums or zoos, we do have them in the museums. They're called ter- uh, torns. We have them in the La Brea Tar Pits. They're gigantic um, condor-like birds that lived in North America as recently as 6,000 years ago. And people who think that some of these are still surviving in the mountains of the West or Appalachia, you know, we don't know if Mothman's a Thunderbird or a giant owl, but it's a lot of overlap in that same area there that with these giant bird-like creatures. They could very well be real. Yeah, you know, so so you bring up Thunderbirds. Uh, I found in my research it's the only common sort of uh, fantastic crypto creature that's found in all uh, North American regional Native American uh, myths and legends. Where do you come down on on Thunderbirds? Uh, are you familiar with any reports or any physical evidence? Um, I've seen on the internet that giant uh, feather. Um, that's been featured in a couple of recent articles. Um, what what kind of information do we have on the Thunderbird? Well, um, I was a I was a primary researcher on the 1948 uh, at Alton, Illinois, St. Louis reports, and my brother Jerry Coleman and myself were the first researchers there for to interview uh, the Lawndale eyewitnesses where the boy was picked up in 1977 right. in Illinois. I, I think all of those are credible sightings, and, and along with Mark Hall, who wrote the book Thunderbirds, you have a migration pattern in the West, the Midwest, and in the East that where these birds are in April, they're going north. I'll tell you what, in, we're going to find out where the Thunderbirds are going. In other seasons with Lauren Coleman and Gene and Chris, you're in... <laughs> Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. 
For 58 years, fate has provided true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate brings you the latest in all aspects of the paranormal, like angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, and much, much more. To receive your complimentary Fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. The world's best solar-powered oven has gotten better. Sun ovens are now available with a brand new Christmas sun dehydrating and preparedness kit, which includes everything required for cooking, water pasteurization, and dehydrating with the power of the sun. Prepared families are storing food for months and years, but only have enough fuel stored for days or weeks. A sun oven lets you harness the sun's power to bake, boil, or steam food, heat water for purification or personal hygiene, or dehydrate. For the past 25 years, Sun Ovens have been proudly made in the U.S., are durable, and have a long life, and come with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Don't be fooled by cheap imitations. For a limited time, preppers can save $65 on the purchase of a Christmas Sun Dehydrating and Preparedness Kit. For a discount coupon, visit sunoven.com slash GCN. That's sunoven.com slash GCN. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. Introducing a Diabetes Breakthrough, an easy, natural, organic way to bring relief to diabetics. Introducing MDS Forte, a concentrated super strength extract formulated for those who are looking for relief. What can MDS Forte do for you? MDS Forte reduces glucose levels safely and effectively, reduces cholesterol and triglyceride levels, increases HDL or good cholesterol while reducing LDL or bad cholesterol. MDS Forte reduces A1C, improves eyesight and circulation to the limbs, and helps with weight loss. Is non-toxic, caffeine-free, 100% natural, 100% organic, and comes with a 100% money back guarantee waiting for the side effects disclaimers with mds forte there are none order a 25-day treatment of mds forte by calling 213-405-5355 213-405-5355 or visit bestbloodsupport.com that's bestbloodsupport.com for mds forte a diabetes breakthrough this is Jim Mosley, editor of Saucer Smear, and I'm here to say a good word or two about the Paracast, which I believe is the gold standard of paranormal radio. Listen to it if you can. So with Gene and Chris, we're talking to Lauren Coleman, and we're talking about the migration habits of Thunderbirds. Is that it? That's it. They seem to really migrate in a, a bird-like manner, going north in the Ozarks, up to the Minnesota and Canadian area in April, and coming south in the fall. And you can see this in the west. You can see it in the Ozarks. You can see it in the Appalachians. So I'm not surprised that various native Canadians and Native Americans and Inuits and Eskimos have tales of uh, giant birds because they're certainly they're one of the few creatures that can move around. You can have a very small population and a great many people can see them because they can actually fly around. I mean, you have hardly any whooping cranes in this country, yet uh, people see them in all different parts of the country, you know, from Canada to Texas. It's a small little group, but they're they're easy to see. What about the more dinosauria type uh, sightings, like from 
West Texas, and and I think the Great Great Bend. Uh, well, I, I I know you'll think it's a broken record, but once again, I come down on the side of the mammals versus the reptiles here. Uh, the reports that I've investigated from along the Rio Grande, they often talk about leathery skin and. You know, then they quickly go to pterodactyls. This has got to be a pterodactyl. Well, as I've pointed out many times, there's bats. There's giant bats. There's fruit bats. There's all kinds of unknown bats that are being reported. That When you look at them from a distance, they look like a pterodactyl. Um, you know, people don't notice their head. They notice the wings. They notice the sharp angles. I also investigated reports of pterodactyls in the U- Yucatan, Mexico, and those turned out to be... Uh, albatross at a very high altitude. Misidentification, uh, as well as a possible misidentification in a roundabout way of another cryptid. I think there are giant cryptid bats that are being mistaken for pterodactyls. Hmm, that's interesting. I've never heard that theory before, but it makes sense. Uh, yeah. Plus, you know, it's it's difficult to judge size versus distance when you're looking up into the sky. Oftentimes, something that's fairly close to you can seem and appear to be further away and of course that would then lend uh you know the size larger uh in the eyes of a, of a witness who's startled and, and has seen something they're not expecting to see so that would make that would make sense to me and good good point that you bring up yeah well are you guys coming up to maine to the international cryptozoology museum soon i would love to i'm i'm, I'm real excited about it um i don't make it up to new england as often as I'd like, I, I did live in the Boston area in Cambridge for a couple of years, and and it'd be fun to get up there and uh, and get to Portland and and uh, and finally get a chance to meet you. We've we've actually never met, and I'd uh, I'd really welcome that opportunity. And and uh, it would be a lot of fun for me to go to to your museum and pick your brain a little bit. Uh, this has really been right. quite fun for me, and it's uh, it's really a pleasure having you on the show, Lauren. I'll tell you what, before Thank we you. go, are there any more questions? I think uh, we've pretty much uh, done them all. Uh, there are some, but uh, it would just be going over old ground. Okay, so we know where you are and what you're doing, Lauren, but in terms of actually doing the kind of research that needs to be done, what are your right. feelings? The kind of research that needs to be done, let's take Bigfoot, for instance. We need to put a woman in the woods for six months. It needs to be funded. You need to have her in a safe place, maybe with two or three other women, and that's the way. When that's how Bigfoot is going to come to a woman. Men put off pheromones that scare them away. We need to fund a woman out in the woods. So basically, men are threats to Bigfoot. The the it's it's either a pheromone or something that men do that really we're not getting Bigfoot coming to any of those sites where they're. They're planning themselves. We're finding... Uh, so they can't cover it up. Men can't basically wear cologne or something. Or wear Chanel well, number 5 or something like their wives no, do. No, you don't want women wearing perfume in the woods. But the Jane Goodalls and the Diane Fossey, uh, you know, models are there for Bigfoot, too. People just need to follow them. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, we've also, of course, had reports a Bigfoot being attracted to uh, women on their menstrual cycle. True, but in my book, The Bigfoot, The True Story of Apes in America, I overthrow the myth that Bigfoot are out there kidnapping Native women. Bigfoot actually hijacks and kidnaps men more often than women. Yeah, I think good they're, old bringing them back, they're bringing back for breeding because they know the gene pool is short, so they're always introduced to a young female Bigfoot. Well, that would be a heck of a date to have to deal with. Oof. It would. It would. You know, the you couldn't couldn't overcome that experience. I mean, it would make <laughs> no, a good Mr. YouTube Bigfoot, I don't want to. He's not my type. <laughs> That's a date I don't want to have. She doesn't have. She doesn't have too, <laughs> enough freckles for me, or something. Uh, now, seriously okay, speaking you, here, when Bigfoot brings someone in there, they kidnap somebody. They ever come back? Yeah, yeah, that's how we've heard about the ones that I write about, Albert Osman. And yeah, Albert Osman. Reports. Yeah, and, and, you know, there's some of them where they talk about them being the, not the Osman one, but a more recent one where the guy had on a a, a long 
uh, red underwear, and he said the Bigfoot kept pulling at the underwear like it was another skin. Or they pick him up in sleeping bags, or they pick him up in a big fur coat. It's almost as if the Bigfoot are getting confused and think this outer covering is some kind of covering of another kind of Bigfoot. And I think that's what's happening. They're they're trying to kidnap these men for breeding purposes, and they don't know that they're men. They think they're another form of Bigfoot. So they're not very smart. No, I don't think so, no. I don't think they're smart at all. I think uh, Neanderthal are smarter. Neanderthal had culture. They had fire. They had all kinds of things going on for them. And now they've even got commercials. But, um, you know, Bigfoot just has the beef jerky commercial. So. Well, of course, you know, obviously Neanderthals have the Geico commercials. They try to do a TV show, you know, based right. on the caveman concept. Yeah, it, and it, it out, went it? nowhere. It lasted like four it went, episodes. It went south, right? Yeah. Actually, it went to, I think, north somewhere. North to Alaska. <laughs> All right. But well, no, this it's been is good talking to you guys. Yeah, I'll Pretty tell you good. what. Be, in the remaining two or three minutes we have left, it's your time, Lauren Coleman. Give us your best pitch to have people go to visit the International Cryptozoology Museum. You're on. Actually, you know, I think that. All communities needed to be supported for their cryptozoological Mothman, Lake Monster, and Bigfoot museums. There's no reason that people in California shouldn't be going to the Bigfoot Discovery Museum. There's no reason that people visiting West Virginia shouldn't go to the Mothman Museum. If you find yourself in the little corner of the country we call New England or Red Sox Nation, Come up to Portland, Maine, and go to the top 10, one of the top 10 weirdest museums in the world. We're on all the lists, and the Cryptozoology Museum is like something you will have never seen before. It's the only right. Cryptozoology Museum in the world. Come and visit. You guys come for free. Okay, but oh. the others, you have to pay $7 for adults, $5 for kids. It's not like, you know, going to Disney World where they want $400 for everything. Right. No, it's very inexpensive. And, uh, you know, you stay as long as you want. You take as many pictures as you want. And uh, you ask me as many questions as you have time for. And that's an interesting point here, too. Do you sell souvenirs or something? We have a, a local artist that okay. makes little Bigfoot uh, items. And I have... Some of my books that I autograph for people, and we have T-shirts, of course. What else can you ask for? Chris O'Brien, tell our listeners where they can find more of the things that you do. Well, I have a website, OurStrangePlanet.com. It is a strange planet, and it's Our Strange Planet. Plus, I'm a moderator at forum.theparacast.com. Come join in the fun. We have a bunch of really up-to-speed folks that post there. And, again, Lauren, thank you so much for being on the show, taking time out to uh, speak with us. You're very popular uh, at the Paracast, and we're going to have a nice discussion on the forums after the show airs. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm quite humbled to be here because I know you guys are quite famous in the, in the world of Paracast, so it's great to be here. I should mention that if people want to find out when we're open, go to cryptozoologymuseum.com and that's our website that our nice docents have put up and you'll get all your information there on the museum. Thank you guys. The Paracast featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in the Paracast. <laughs>